Max, we don't have much time for a lot of this chitty chat stuff. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah. We have like extensive notes. We have, I think, the longest notes we've ever done. <laughs> It's quite a lot of information in there. So I think we're just going to drop that intro and, and get cracking because we've got a lot to talk about. All right. I think that's just what we're going to do. So let's find an intro. Let's drop it and let's get cracking. Yeah. Yes, indeed, Nitro is the glory, but e-buggy pays the bills. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode number 229 of the No Name RC podcast. We're slowly encroaching on that 250 number, Max. You know, 20 more to go, 21 more to go. We're getting there. Uh, thank you for joining me, Max. Thank you to everybody out there. Um, well, we got a lot to talk about, so we're not going to uh, dilly-dally. We're going to go right into it. So let me get in there and start saying my thank yous. Thank you first to all of the NNRC squad around the world. We guys can't do without you guys sharing it, uh, doing what you got to do. If you haven't gone to our YouTube channel, hit that like, subscribe, uh, and notification button, please do. Also leave a comment or share. If you're listening to this on an audio platform, uh, leave a review, leave a comment. Uh, also leave a comment in the YouTube stuff. Let's help grow that, you, that NNRC YouTube. I want to get up to 4,000 subs. We're about... 330 away, I think. 320 something away. Um, also, thank you to the patrons of the NNRC. You will get early access to this podcast. Uh, I've been trying to get a little more active. I was planning to do a Patreon pod, had things come up this week. We'll get back out there next week. Maybe me and Max will do it. We haven't done one for a while. If you wish to be support the podcast, you can. The links are in the written description, or you can become a YouTube member, get the same benefits. Uh, also, we can't do this without companies. If your company, you like what we're doing, you want to promote on the NNRC. Also, I think I'll go to the Nationals. So, um, look, if you're interested in helping me go to the Nationals and like what I do at, at, at races, hit me up. We got some tears. I want to go to the Nationals, I think. Uh, but they are, you know, high tech. Sorry, Invisible Speed. The Invisible Speed course has started. Uh, I believe they started two days ago. Joseph said it was going pretty good. So that's good. It was well attended. High Tech RC. Some Padal USA. We actually have a giveaway from some Padals for some on-road batteries. Sidewinder Fuel, our new sponsor. Thank you to Sidewinder Morgan Fuels for all their help. Mayako, Beach RC, Techno RC, Clinic RC, Ignite Design RC, bringing gas truck back, Racecraft USA, just so that they shipped out all the command or the shipping out their command modules and their new hat drop. Uh, shout out to Carl RC. I have some uh, a link where you can save 10% on their pro cleaning products. Shout out to my boy Danny Paz at WRCE, Connie Swenson at House of RC. Shout out to RCGP. And also shout out to our NNRC drivers. They are David Ronafalk, Jared Tebow, Robert Badia, and Alexander. Hagberg. Uh, also, some quick birthdays, Max. We got a few birthdays on her. Happy birthday to Little Bump. He has gone 12 years old. I still think he is the official youngest driver because I think the other Korean young man, Hong, Hong Yu, I, I'm probably butchering that, but the young man who came second at FAMCA, I think he's already 12, going 13 this year. So he was trying to figure that out at the Worlds, but it looks like Little Bump is the younger. He, he just went 12, where I think the other young man is going 13 this year. Uh, happy birthday to Little Bump. Uh, happy birthday to Hampus. I think he went 19. So happy birthday to him. Shout out to my boy Chris Figueroa. So his birthday, that's the guy. He's doing a whole bunch of stuff with Caster. 
Uh, Nick Damon celebrated his birthday from RC Racing TV. Uh, to my good friend Trevor in Canada, Charlie Marinona, who I haven't seen racing for quite some time, stock racer. His birthday, Kai Goff, another stock racer from Florida that I've had the pleasure to meet. And RC Horton, happy birthday to you guys. If you guys have a birthday and I don't see it, just send me a message. I don't see it all, and I'll shout them out. Shout out to Lance McDonald, Danny Pass, they're doing the Florida RC Championships the what, this weekend. I think this is probably the best series in America. Uh, it's being held in Callahan. It's just in Florida. It's going to have coverage. It has VIP pits. I believe it's sold out. I believe these sell out before they even, like in a matter of a day. So they go to uh, this weekend. Danny's busy. Danny Superstar is talking to Lance as well. That Lance says he's not going to have a weekend off until the end of June. So those guys are super busy doing a lot of things. Shout out. Oh, what I listened to this weekend, Action RC Podcast. It's an Australian podcast. They had Rick Howard on. They had Mark Pavitas on a couple of weeks ago as well. I listened to that. That's pretty good. Check them out. Speaking of Australians, we're going to have a bunch of Australians on next week. Well, not a bunch, just two. Zach and Ben Panic haven't chatted with those guys for a while. Uh, so check that out. Uh, but check out uh, Action RC Podcast. I will try and leave a link. Or I will leave a link for in the written description of this podcast. Uh, I wanted to shout out to my boy Lorenzo. He wasn't feeling well a few months ago, and he seems to have gotten over his Crohn's a little bit. He messaged me the other day. His work. He said he's got two jobs. He said I work two jobs, and I'm 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 getting back off to the track. So I'm happy to see him getting back. I know he was in a lot of um discomfort earlier on this year. So good to see. And shout out to HRCR. I was watching uh Brian and his son. The building. It's still snowing out there, but it's enough to build. They were building the driver stand for HRCR's eight scale track. Man, that guy's building an awesome facility up there. He's got eight scale on road, eight scale off road, indoor carpet. Very nice facility. I can't wait to see uh, the finished product of that. All right, Max. Um, That's all. I, oh, shout out to Tim Barf. Keep your head up. Positive vibes sent to you as well as Stu Trotter. If you guys got a chance, shoot those guys a message. They're going through some, some uh, issues right now. I'm sure they would like to talk to you guys. Uh, Max, what's up? I, you know what? I really enjoyed last week's podcast. Yeah, that was good. We were just hanging out. Uh, talking about RC, nerding out, you know, that's what it's all about. <laughs> that's what it was good. I geeked out on it. Uh, yeah. it was a good chat with Will. I forgot to ask Will if he followed the crowd and used inverted shocks. I forgot to mention inverted shocks to him at all, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I so. think, I think it's it's good. I hope he didn't use them. Uh. I'm pretty, <laughs> but he's an associated guy, so I'm pretty sure, yeah, he I did. probably. Probably use them. Going but with but them. thank you to the briefcase for his time last week. It was a great catch up with him with the MKGP. I look forward. I think as a, I'm recording this and as this released, I think Extra Lap will record release their podcast, and they actually went to the event as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing what they have to say. But uh, Max, I guess yeah, man. What's anything you want to touch on before we kind of move on? I know you're kind of full into school. No RC right now. Yeah. Or? Yeah, not, not a lot of RC right now. I've been doing some designing, um, getting ready for the outdoor season. So that, but obviously, you can't do outdoor racing there. How much snow do you have there? Well, actually, we just had a bit of rain, so the snow is slowly melting. But okay. it, it has been about a foot of snow. Yeah, I think Joseph is off to Spain next week, he told me. I think yeah. it's next week. I'm not sure if David is already there, but I think they're him and David and, and Robert are all, all, all going to the go test go. and uh, getting ready for the season in Europe. Yeah, I think they go test. I think Robert and him go to IBC. It's not IBC. They go to Philippine Masters and then mm -hmm. they come back and then it's going to be IBC, uh, which is coming up as well. Um, yeah. Max, I think we should just, if we have nothing else to talk about, I think we should get right into our news and, uh, cause oh, we do yeah. have quite a little bit of news and our news is brought to you by invisible speed. Uh, like I said, JQ and high tech RC JQ uh, has started the live meetings. I believe this week, they're going pretty well. You have Ronald Falcon there, Tebow in there and, uh, Robert Battier. If you wish to join the invisible speed, we have some links, some affiliate links in the written description above helps us out a little bit. This is the old ad for this. So the discount in her does not count for this. I just think Joseph needs to make a new ad, dude. He does. He would <laughs> tell me make a new ad. Like, you need to make a new ad. Yeah, no. It's it's been almost a year. What the fuck? Yeah, come on, JQ.
thank you, Invisible Speed, for your continued support. Also, the news is brought to you by High Tech RC, who has been a great supporter of the No Name RC podcast. They just released their new RDX2 1000 ACDC dual port charger at discharge and discharger and power supply. Uh, it has a sleek modern design. It's easy to transport handle. The RDX2 1000 is AC. It's an ACDC powerhouse you need to charge all of your high capacity battery packs at rapid rates. The dual op- Outports each offer up to 20 amps of power simultaneously, so you can charge two batteries at once. It also has an easy-to-use LCD interface display and a handy push-button controls that you can use as well. I'm not sure about the Bluetooth dongle, though. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the Bluetooth dongle here, which I th- I really did like. Uh, but it makes it perfect for stock class races because you can, you know, you can pump up the amps. You know, the guys like to charge up at high amps, and you can charge up to 40 amps with this. Also, they have the AD350 discharge model, which is sold separately. It's an analyzer and discharger. Uh, the stock price on that is $149.99, and the price on the RDX2 1000 is $279.99. You can go to High Tech, where to buy to find. I believe a has them. Uh, go on their website and check them out. I don't know if they have them in stock, but thank you to High Tech for all of their support. Maximus, dude, there was a lot of racing going on this weekend. A lot of racing. A lot it's of like racing. every every single place in the world has some kind of races going on, and uh, it yeah. was pretty. Even insane. even in Finland, we had one race. Really? Yeah, I okay. didn't go. It was a ten scale race in Dallas, but yeah, we had one race last week. So yeah, DNC two point was like uh, just probably the local guys that went there, and a few other. I saw a few guys run from Vegas. It, it's. Now the track is completely underwater again because it's been raining all week. But it looks like Pavitas won. We had JBR out 10 scale, I think their first round of the year. Round one. Tom from Render Connect, who I need to get on this podcast against two wheel drive and four wheel drive. No surprise, he's really fast at SDRC. Mm-hmm. He's really fast, period. I like Tom. Yeah, I think I think uh Tom is kind of one of those guys who consistently is fighting, you know, the top guys in America. Like even sometimes he can you know get a round off a fan or something, you mm-hmm. know? he's that fast. But he just doesn't have a name for himself, you know, in in the big scheme of things. Yeah, I and think, he's also working in the industry, which is something different. Yeah, yeah, and I think one reason is that he's only ten scale. Not, I mean, I guess he does. He was at DNC. Yeah, he does eight, it's, it's, eight scale. Yeah, but it's not. At least the perception I've got is he doesn't. That's not he does. his priority. He just does. He actually was. Uh, he seeded very well at DNC. I think in eBuggy. Really? Yeah. Maybe I'm just out of the loop. But Maybe. at least, at least. Oh, he uh, may have seeded one run really well. I can't remember. Yeah. At least a few years past, he was mostly ten scale focused. Yeah. All right. Uh, also, we had a big indoor race up in Colorado Springs. It was put on by TNR Raceway, the Saint Pat Saint Patrick's Bonanza. Uh, held at Colorado Springs, like, you know, Horse Arena. Now, this looks like it's, like, I look at this. This literally looks like it's in the middle of nowhere, like on the top <laughs> of a mountain somewhere. But uh, my friend Mike Norris and Shannon, they attended. And then I saw, like, Graham and a lot of those Colorado Mayako guys attended this race. So uh, I believe this happened before. Did you celebrate St. Patrick's Day at all, Max? Oh, we don't have that here. <laughs> I mean, not, I think that it's like I know, but most of these holidays are just American corporate scams to get people to spend. But money. I'm saying, like, St. Patrick's Day is kind of like a universal thing. Like, Irish people are everywhere. We, yeah, I, it's not a holiday, is, like a day off. Yeah, we don't, but, we don't have, we don't have any Irish people here. So, well, that's that, probably why one place they didn't that they don't yeah. have Irish people in Finland. I'm pretty sure there are Irish people in Finland. But maybe not to not the really. Extent. To be honest, there there really isn't a noticeable Irish population. Not even maybe there are like one like individual people who have moved over, but definitely not like an. Irish well, I mean, population. I used to just like this holiday because it was an excuse to go drink. And party. Yeah, I think that's kind of the thing in America. It's just like. Uh, well, I think it's a thing in out. Ireland too because they seem to enjoy this as well. So, but yeah, I think I don't I don't know where it, I have no clue where it came from. Is it like well, I, I would assume it came day? from Ireland? Yeah, yeah, but is it like a national day for them? Or no idea. Just... Maybe we should have done some research. Maybe one of our Irish listeners will let us know. Yeah, yeah, we we'll let our listeners do it. <laughs> yeah, there we <laughs> the go. Job for us. Yeah, but uh, yeah, they look like no, definitely no. Um, what you call it? 
St. Patrick's Day in Northern Europe. I don't know. I'm pretty sure they drank a lot of beer at this race. That's what yeah. I would have yeah. seen. Yeah. Race. So. Uh, hot race race as well over in Italy at the Genza Nitro Buggy Club. I saw that Barufalo was doing a lot for this as well. Uh, you did Yeah. I think I think he's from the area. In fact, uh, let let me get a picture of the track. Um, you know, yeah, these Italian so, tracks are starting to look more like American tracks. You know, maybe not I as many that, That's a, that's actually a, a great point you made because if you look at Ongaro's track, I don't have a picture of it right now, but if you look at Ongaro's track. It, he has put on a lot more jumps, you know, mm. rhythm sections, kind of stuff like that. And definitely this track, like Italian track tracks have always been, I'd say quite good. You know, they are flowing, they're quite fast, but they have still jumps and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I, I think, but I, I definitely agree that they have moved towards more t- jump technical tracks in the past few years. I mean, yeah. it still has some Euro style, though. It's not all 180s. Oh, it has a lot of it's, 180s. It I has think, some I think, chicanes and stuff. Yeah, I think the difference between, you know, like if you look at tracks from Europe to tracks from America, it's always that in American tracks, corner speed really isn't a thing. Mm-hmm. Like it's very rare that a track has a section where you aren't going either full throttle and turning or you aren't going like really slow, like medium speed where you have to keep the speed up. Those type of corners just aren't really that big in America. But in Europe, yeah, that's I think that's what. Yeah, I think that's really what they struggled with at Redavon too. You know, oh, hundred percent. I think and that was a big issue. And the issue at Redavon too is that the track is so big, so mm-hmm. you have to drive in a technical way to keep your corner speed up. But because the track is so huge, you're carrying a lot of speed. So it's not like it's a high speed section. It's a sort of a medium speed section, but it's still a really, you know, open. Mm-hmm. So that's that's something that I myself have noticed. That like that separates like people because the lap time differences can be huge. It can be like obviously the lap time is quite long, but still mm-hmm. it can be like over two seconds. Uh, between like the top guys and the top twenty five guys or something, you know. So I think the, be the best really... comparison to do is that America's Supercross racing, yeah, and then I would yeah. say that Europeans more motocross e. You know. Yeah, but also I think in America the the thing is that the the influence comes from you know BMX or Supercross, but in Europe it comes from cars. You know, if this you is true at, too. If you look at like rally cross, school, yeah, rally cross type of thing, obviously due to American influence, we have gotten like big jumps and stuff like that. In almost every track has at least one big jump, but like all the really old tracks, the layouts, those are really like based off of the style of you know rally cross. And mm-hmm. stuff like that. Well, I mean, like the BRCA even calls this one eighth rally oh, cross. Yeah, I believe. yeah, so, they they call it yeah. the rally cross. So okay, and well, it, it, in the if you look at F rules, um, you can run like a rally cross car body, so you can run mm. a, you know a sedan car in there. Uh, but it's it's that's kind of where the class started from, I think. And then you know, obviously, everyone wanted to run buggies mm-hmm. instead of those. All right. Well, we're going to look at results real quick. Elliot Boots wins this with Bork Kilek in second, uh, Matteo Palito fourth, Barton third, Barufalo sixth, Kilek Barkan the the younger one fifth, Robert in eighth, Valente seventh, Ravaglia in ninth. And then I would I know I met I met the guy Astriano Gabriel. I don't know the other guys, but there's nine guys, there's top nine guys. I would not be surprised if any of those guys are in like European finals. All them guys should be in semifinals. So, yeah, that's it's it's crazy how deep the field in Italy is. Like, Mm -hmm. really, like, okay, Kilic brothers and Robert and Boots were there, but still, there's like, even if Ungaro was missing from this race, there was still like a load. So, Italian. I know, and there was even some guys that probably like, and and the thing is that everybody up to eight finished on fifty-one laps. Yeah, so that's, that's boots. Really... Boots almost went fifty-two 
Uh, boots and yeah. Kilek. Uh, yeah. but I think Kilic, I think Kilic TQ'd uh, actually. So he did so. pretty good, but yeah. Speaking one, of yeah. Ongaro, he was out racing on road. Yeah, so he was racing. I was I was looking into this. Mm-hmm. So let me get up the photo of the podium. So he was racing with uh, one eighth GT. Yeah, so this was surprising. He was racing one eighth on road. He wasn't racing um, like GT on road. Not uh, no, like, he's racing. Uh, it's called GT. Yeah, one eighth GT. So yeah. he was racing with obviously associated doesn't have a car, so he can race any car. But what was surprising to me was he was racing Gimar engine, like you said. Well, I like think Gimar has a, a specific uh, GT engine, but OS as well. has too. OS OS sell an engine called like GT engine or whatever. Well, maybe the Gimar ones are better because they're very popular in the GT class. Yeah, I mean, I, I think- remember. Yeah, they are. And I think the reason why he ran it was because this car was built by this guy who has this... I think it's the guy who has this brand, Genius. Mm-hmm. And they sell Gimar engines, I think. Okay. Or at least there's like a strong affiliation between all of them. So like what most likely happened was someone built the car for Ngara and he went to race. I doubt that. Yeah, he I said, think everything was done for him. Oh, 100%. Like he said... I, I read his Facebook post and he said... You know, um, oh, he, he thanks these people, blah, blah, blah. And he had like a few days of practice before the race and then just did the race. And okay. He ended up uh, finishing second. So I, I was a bit expecting him to win, but I guess it's they still like fast people on on road. Dude, Italy. because if if they go, if so, you, these do seven minute qualifiers, if I'm not correct, right? If, if I'm correct. Yeah. And th- they struggle to do seven minutes, or they used to. I know my buddy was trying to get it to do his car to do seven minutes on the tank. It, this this type of racing, I mean, I I think he should have been too because kind of it's not it's not that ass out type of drifty style racing. It's like you got to mm-hmm. hit your lines, you got to be right. You know, this is on road, not trying to upset the car too much, none mm-hmm. of that. You know. So I, I think he's just doing this to have some fun. Maybe he made some money off this. Who knows? Um, but he, when you're David Angaro and you're a two-time world champion, people want you to go run on road. You go run on road. Yeah. You, just, you just show up. Yeah. I'm kind of like, when I saw, like, this isn't the first time he's run this class. He's run the class before at least a few mm. times. Um, I think with the same brand car. I'm not sure exactly, but I believe it's the same brand car. Uh, the okay. Genius. But... Well, uh, what I was thinking, like, is this class going to become, you know, something bigger? Because there's... Dude, this class is big world. in Latin America. Like, you don't yeah, understand. I know. This I, class I, I, is big. I, yeah, that's what I, I was going to say. Like, in Australia, I think it has some, you know... They're influence. having a pre-worlds there. Yeah, yeah, that too. And then um, in Asia, it's definitely quite big. Uh, in Latin America, it's huge. This is like, the I, I believe this is the biggest class they race. This is the biggest class they race. Yeah. And then um, in Italy, clearly, it's kind of picking up in Southern Europe. And in America, racing. too. In America, a lot of the people race this class now. Yeah. And so, also there's a guy from Eastern, here. Yeah, in Eastern Europe, there's people who race that, Right, too. right, so, right, right. So it's, it's I think, yeah, uh, it's like hey, very It's the only class places. racing her. It's the yeah. only class racing her in DR. I have yeah. one right there. I have a Mugen one. They so race in Santa Domingo. Yeah. I'm interested if there will be a situation where this class will sort of be that. See more professional become, off-road guys yeah, going over like, there? Because in the end, if you look at X-Ray, Serpent, all of these brands who uh, do a GT car, it's basically their off-road car. Mm-hmm. And then it just kind of like, you know, you're making a truggy out of a buggy. Kind of mm-hmm. the same thing, but adjust like for on road. Uh, obviously, you need to have a two speed and, and stuff like that, but mostly just taking off the side guards, uh, then doing some new hubs. Different shock towers. And different shock towers and maybe shorter shocks. But it's not a lot it. of stuff, dude. It's not a yeah. lot of stuff. It's it's repurposing. All, like that GT uses all the MBX7 parts. Yeah, no I know. Problem. And, and I've, I've been looking at this because there was a time when there was a JQ driver in, I think, Croatia. Yeah, Dennis. Uh, he, yeah, he did 
he did a JQGT, and it was it was mm-hmm. as he said, it was actually really really good. Mm-hmm. So there was a time where I was like, should I do it? But then I just like no, not enough time for it. But I kind of personally, I feel this class has makes a lot of sense. You know, mm-hmm. it's you can repurpose a lot of parts. It's an on road class. It's four wheel drive. You know, it, it. I don't know about the tire situation. Are the tires super expensive? All of that stuff. Same as buggy. Really? You think so? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because like on road, the tires tire game is even worse than off. Well, this is really. same as same size, seventeen millimeter. It uses, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you I know, think it's just, just rubber. Yeah, but I think just like the prices of tire and like right. because they the non road the tire game is definitely a bit more tricky. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think. But I, I think, think this, this class this is has, not as ex, as hard or as much. It's time consuming. Don't get me wrong. Not yeah. as bad as the GP class with the firm tires and having five engines and all that. Yeah. Stuff. Oh, yeah. I think the issue I feel with the foam tire classes, uh, so one tenth on road and one eighth uh, on road, um, is the fact that those cars are like so fast. Uh, they are really expensive because <laughs> that Infinity one eighth. Um, on road buggy that cost you pretty much nine hundred or a thousand, depending on mm. where you buy. It. You mean their their on road car? Yeah, on road car, just the car, the kit. It's a thousand or nine hundred between the dollars, um, the price. And I don't know about other brands, but I'd expect them to be around the same. So yeah, it's an expensive car. Then you have to buy multiple engines because they go through a lot of them. Um, then tires tires um and if you hit a wall at, that, at 75 miles an hour you yeah you know, you've done your, you've toasted your car yeah and so yeah it's it's and it's definitely not a class that's easy to get into a hundred percent i All right. I've, I've seen it firsthand so i kind yeah. of it's i've fun kind though. of see it is fun for sure and it, ha- it does have you know the longest legacy of anything in rc but I 100% believe like the GT class will begin to rise a bit. Um, I, I don't know if it. we'll ever become to the standard of, you know, um, whatever other on road classes are, but definitely as we see the 110th and 18th on road, the foam classes, they are, let's be honest, they are kind of dying out in lots of parts in the world. Like, professional market is almost totally gone like infinity is almost the only brand x-ray doesn't do anything with that class anymore serpent does but they yeah, don't have any pro drivers yeah but they aren't on the nitro oh nitro okay you're talking yeah. about nitro. electric okay, okay. touring is doing fine i think yeah, electric yeah. touring is almost better than in a few years but um nitro on road classes are definitely a bit dying so i might see a switch where they don't even have a track for the raw nationals because i have oh by the way our guest this week is the new raw president clayton young he was telling me they don't have a track for the on-road paved nationals nitro nationals this year so Mm -hmm. it's funny uh all right let's move on because we did have the french e E buggy nationals round one chris sarkozer i thought that this track was great too um I, i he did some lives from there i thought wow what a it was big to realize the track was so huge uh, Jordan Lat wins with Savoya at oh I, Jordan Lat beat Savoya. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. that that was crazy too. So mm. uh, Savoya second and and to me, yeah, it was a bit bit of a surprise that uh, Jordan Lat beat Savoya. But even a bigger surprise was to me uh, Noha Ben Mohammed being finishing third. And if you look at the list of drivers, there was uh, guys who finished. Finished high before uh, Iram Sartel, uh, Theo Lemaire, uh, Montpellier finalist. Uh, Remy Bermudez. Bermudez. All of these, yeah, all of these guys like done really well at big races before. Corentin Lozin, he used to drive yeah. JQ. Uh, and, missing from this, no I don't see any of the uh, Majubes or Tom yeah, Robbins. I don't know. Tom Robin missing Majubes. I believe it just might be they aren't doing their e buggy. Nice. And they did e truggy too, as well. So they did, but I don't think in France. Yeah, but I don't think there was many 
Top driver. Come on, Max. Come on, Max. Come on. Let's go, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving yeah. on. The next race here was the surprise race. Talking to my Australian fans, they didn't even know this was happening. Uh, we had the Femke race in Taiwan, which uh, I think I'm pretty familiar with this track because I think this is like where Leo Hara and yeah. um, Let me Luca and his them. dad used to always race. And those JQ guys used to race there. It's under a bridge or under an overpass. It's a, yeah. it's actually a pretty interesting track. But the big thing is, I did not, not know this was happening until it was happening. So I think Asia RC actually was doing the coverage too, who's actually really yeah. good at doing this stuff. Yeah, Asia RC is definitely, it's been a little bit surprising how... It's been a while since how, we've seen something from them. I mean, they do a race once in a while. Um, but yeah, here's a video of by Asia RC uh, from the Nitro Buggy final. So this is a track that's under the bridge. I think people have seen lots of videos about this online. It's definitely a little bit of a weird place to place a track, but it's, I mean, it works. And uh, there was a lot of people at this race, but not a lot of like um, the usual Femke people. Right, right. There was no Kyle so, McBride there. There was no uh, Atsushi Hara, nothing like that. Yeah, Even though I don't think so, Hara goes to these races, but you know what I mean? Yeah, but like I think, uh, it, it he like he's the infinity representative or whatever. I didn't expect him to be just like horror. Oh, horror, yeah, yeah. Well, it was like so no Australians there. there. There was like yeah, no, no, no like, New Zealanders there, nothing. Here is uh, you know, view of the people, so it looks like just Southeast Asia, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Koreans, so it's. So we Vietnamese, have Vietnam, Singapore, Cam- yeah. Philippine drivers, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia. So pretty much like only Southeast um, Asians, not not from Australia, not Far East. Uh, yeah, but it was still an official East Femke countries. race. And I'm sure that uh, the Australian guys are going to have a lot to talk say about this next week. So we'll do out more on that yeah. next week. But uh, we did have... Some very, you know, we, we were talking about this Sparco car and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, well, we had a Sparco car. We had quite a few Sparco cars uh, at in the A-Main. We had an Agama. We had a JQ Black Edition. I'm not even sure who that is. I think it's, I can't remember his name. Uh, and then the car that won was the Ming Yang car. Yeah. So there was, I think this Sparco guy finished... Uh, in third, or no, not in third. He finished somewhere in like top five. But yeah, this was like the first, uh, first like I think big race we mm-hmm. s- saw seen this car in. And it's weird because hey, go, back, go back to that one. Well, never oh. mind. Don't worry about it. Um, it's yeah, weird because but- we. It was a bunch of them in the A-Main. So it's like, all. I guess they're all locals, I guess, Taiwan. Yeah, and uh, I think looking at the chart, Sparko was the most popular. It was No, it was third most popular car. S-Work was the most popular. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, look, they had a chart about it. Yeah, I was looking at this. Okay, that was that's kind of, all right. It, it looked like something else. All right. Yeah. Uh, but one thing, okay. actually, that was uh, surprising to me was... Uh, the one car I spotted was an, a car that's not released in Europe, but uh, Taiwan being sort of the manufacturing hub of cars in the world. Um, even an Agama N1 uh, at this race. Yeah, this is the first one I've seen that doesn't have Lee driving, I would say. Yeah, Lee or John Hazelwood. Yeah. Um and uh yeah, last the show uh is the people had a lot of questions what this car was. So it's called Ming Yang. Uh I think Ming Yang. I don't I don't know how it's like pronounced in Taiwanese or Chinese, whichever language that is. Either way, this is like a car that has been released. I think they released it in uh um twenty sixteen. Um, yeah, let let me get the pictures up. So it was released in like 2016. I think I have it here. So. Yeah. There we go. 
Yeah. So released in 2016, I think, to the you know worldwide market. Uh, in French, this same buggy is sold under the Pirate RS2, I believe. It's the same car, just different branding. And um, if we look at the rear end of the car, I think many people can find it quite similar to a certain buggy already on the market. Uh, so basically what... Which uh, buggy would that be, Max? <laughs> I don't, don't want to upset anyone, so I'll let people make up their mind. For the audio viewers... Um, you you got to say, say it for the audio viewers. What car... For the, for the audio viewers, um, as far as I've been reading, you know, from online and from people who sort of have any official affiliation with Ming Yang. Um, they are the factory that manufactures HP racing cars. And uh, Oh, they do look like, it does look like an HP. I just looked at the radio box and all that stuff. Yeah, so basically, uh, I believe, uh, I'm, I have not 100% evidence of this, but all the things point out to this being sort of the, original manu uh, manufacturer for HP cars, at least some of their parts. And uh, basically this car is uh, just using using some of those designs, maybe leftover parts, whatever. And then mm -hmm. they released the car under their own brand. So if you look at the rear end, it's like almost identical um, in many ways, uh, like the gearboxes and, and so on. Mm. Um, in the front, even the, they shock, have, the, the body is the ugly. Like, let's that yeah, body is ugly, fugly. I know, I know. But uh, one thing is, uh, they have this. Um, well, actually, now that we we have the new HBR almost out, they actually went to the low C style front end with mm. a lot of offset. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so basically, the car is quite similar actually in, in geometry, too. Yeah, that's so basically what you're wondering. saying is that this is an HB knockoff. HB knockoff, but as far as I know, it's from the actual factory. Okay. That makes how, the car. Well, how does that work? Like, I mean, so hold on. We make HB cars, but now we're going to make this cheaper. I guess it looks a little cheaper. It looks a little cheaper. The materials don't oh, look as good, maybe. So basically, how it works is uh, you are a manufacturer. Uh, someone buys a service from you, like you are going to do this part to us. Then you do the part. Then there is like leftover things or, you know, have all the tech you have and you can just make up a car. Like Hobby Wing is one of these type of brands. They okay. used to make electronics for other electronics companies. Mm -hmm. And then one day they were like, we're just going to make our own brand, you know? And then they started coming up with their own product, you know, gotcha. own development. So nice, basically, nice. it's a difference between these are the manufacturer and then the development of the product happens elsewhere. You know, what type of product do you want? And then you send it over to the manufacturer and they make it. But then here, the manufacturer has been like making, having their own developer basically making the car. And, but yeah. Basically, well, that's they would have a legitimate reason to be upset, the HV guys, because that's a direct copy, it looks like. Uh, yeah, all right. but, yeah, but the, the thing is, like, you can't, like, you can't sue them. <laughs> and also, like, why would you sue your own yeah, they're already, manufacturer yeah. in this case? They are already having, <laughs> having issues with manufacturing chains. And uh, the thing is, like, I would definitely not be surprised if this manufacturer makes some parts for other cars as well. As Joseph has said many times, it's like most likely, uh, like people say often that, oh, this brand is terrible quality and this brand is great quality. And then the outdrives get made at the same factory. So <laughs> it's like just pointless, you know? Mm. All right. Uh, some other news about some cool, like I would say to, uh, anyway, we'll talk more about Famca. Oh, we forgot to say who won. So I, 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 uh, I think, um, the guy who oh, drove this car, I don't know who he is, but I, the one guy I do know is the young kid from Korea because I met him at the Worlds. Uh, I, he's Raz X-Ray. I know JQ would have a conniption because they said vice champion. And 
I believe he's the junior champion. Oh, he's the other Hong. Have you got his name there? I know his name is um, on my tongue. I don't. I don't got the names, but basically, here's the top three yeah. for Ebuggy. Junior. Uh, this is Ebuggy or Junior? Yeah, I think, no. I think this is Ebuggy. Oh yeah, here's the kid that's there. driving the JQ while or driving has a JQ product shirt. On. Yeah, he he drove a Mayako for the Ebuggy, but then a uh, JQ for the Nitro class. No idea why, but um, he likes it, I guess. Yeah, here is the Nitro podium. So this is the Ming Yang car mm-hmm. the X-ray Korean X-ray driving kid finished second, and then the JQ driver finished third. I have no idea what the names are unfortunately i can see if we have the results his name is um, young Kyoi young yeah this is gonna sound so young like, i know uh, i've butchered that yeah so jeff wang is the ming yang guy and then wang Huan ling is the jq guy and then hyun ku young is from the korea ex- from Korea. Uh, so if you look at like this list, most people are like Taiwanese, a few Koreans in there. So it's kind of disappointing because Femka uh, Championship used to be one of those races where there was actually like all of the Asian pros, like a Japanese and uh, also like um, also like uh, Australian drivers and uh, everyone pretty much was there from from uh, all right, Asian. so we don't not. I am not. Tr- no, we're just gonna say that this young man won. Hong Young yeah. Young, Hong yeah. Kyung Hong Kyo Young. Yeah, I know. Mean, I'm yeah. messing that up. I know I'm messing that up. Yeah, but nice young yeah, man. Though. Think, nice young yeah, man. I, I, met him I think it it is quite like it is quite annoying to me to see that this was uh, such a kind of a small event in in if you look at the grand scheme of things because. In the past, it was like obviously I I wouldn't rate Femka championships, um, but it was particularly it was third best. Huh? It was third best. It was yeah, it's Roar, it was that, yeah. Afra and then Femka. I know what you mean. You and think then you rank is, Roar? You rank Roar nationals better than Afra European championship? I think they're about the same. Yeah, I think maybe the Euros has a little bit more prestige because yeah. I because think it's, it's the uh, Euros, but the nationals yeah. is a prestigious race. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I it's think sold it's out. Uh, it's yeah. sold out this week, like for this week. I think definitely when yeah, it's a, a world's year, it's definitely more. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of people want to go to Chico, so I thought it should. It's not sold out. They'd have fifty entries left, but it's being allocated. Yeah. Uh, we, we'll talk more about Famca and why why this happened because it were no Australians there, and they they kind of we're talking about that. Uh, and other news, we have the Club Race Hero 3D printed twelve scales from Scott Jakes. Uh, my buddy BJ brought this to my attention. Basically, you can buy the printed files, make a 3D uh, 12 scale car. I guess uh, this is all geared to getting people into that type of racing at a cheap price. With that being said, uh, Yokomo also announced their new beginner buggy, the RO 1.0. Did not know it was not ready to run. I don't know why you would release something like this that isn't ready to run. I wish, this yeah. is what I wish. I wish Losi, Associated, X Ray, all these manufacturers would make a ready to run. Two wheel drive, full like Associated did, you, ready to race. I should say, decent quality yeah. products, decent. Not you know, and everybody has to race that. Like the only thing you can change would be your tires. You have to race yeah. the spec motor, spec ESC. Uh, probably you can change your control, but just race that car as it is. No other hop ups, nothing. Just have this as a spec beginners class. And I think if all these companies did that, this would be a great beginners class for a lot of people. Yeah, I think the RB10 is a very good car for beginners. Like, if you are planning to get your kid a first RC car and you want to keep the option open for actually racing, not only just bashing, like RB10, the tool drive, that's the perfect car you should get. Is that the uh, associated one, correct? Yeah, that's the associated one. Um, Is it called the RB10? I don't think so. I don't know what it's called. It's been a long time, but I thought when they first released them, it was a great idea, and it's never really caught because no other companies make or well, another company will make something that's out of spec with a different mode or whatever. Yeah. Like that's that's what I abso- absolutely hate. Um, Serpent does make a tool drive like this. I'm pretty sure it's called an RB10, but anyway, the associated tool drive RTR. 
um, buggy. That's definitely because um, here in Finland, we actually had uh, someone running the car. At, uh, at least I think a few people had run the car. on Even on AstroTurf, they just put on some like darts and staggers and then just ran it stock. And it was really good. Um, actually, I had a few pictures of the the 12th scale uh, 3D printable car. So this is actually super interesting. Like uh, basically the idea is like you just 3D print the whole thing, uh, add a few parts on it. Uh, I believe I'm not, I have yet not figured out how the motor is attached. I think it's just like you buy this aluminum uh, part to make it fit. Um, but I think, yeah, it has like different, you know, chassis options. Like you can buy different, you know, parts to make it fit. Uh, like different brand, like this is obviously from another brand. The axle is from another brand and the shock as well. But the chassis is basically 3D printed, uh, same as the arms and so on. So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. I think I kind of have become more of a fan of Pancars lately. Um, I think there, there should be, there should be more, you know, focus on that class because it's quite easy to get into. It's definitely cheap. Uh, it's a low maintenance class. Um, basically, all you have to do is like buy tires, uh, grind them down, and then you, you, sh you should be good for a while. Um, and uh, yeah, it's I, I, I have become to, uh, a fan of punk car racing. What do you okay. think? I would love to, if I could, if we had a place to race it and I could do it, yeah. I would love to race anything right now. Yeah. Only so. issue I have with pan cars, they race with 1S batteries. Like, I don't know how you could, like, what could you do to make it able to be run in 2S? Because here's the thing, like, if you have a bunch of 2S batteries, and then you're thinking, like, should I buy a pan car? But you have to buy different electronics, different, you know, batteries, all that shit. I'm not gonna like try it out to be honest. Uh, but if you could run like well, US... usually with 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 the twelve scale stuff, you, you you have to go smaller, right? So you're gonna have to get yeah. specialty made stuff. Um, it's funny. Yeah, but you could you could run like an LCG. Um, well, I think you're saving thing. so much money on the chassis. I think the whole point is. Like... Yeah, I think so too. But I think it, it at at this day and age, it should be possible to run two S in somehow. Like obviously. Obviously, like the issue is that you have too much power in the 2S, but there should be some probably like, weight too. I don't know, maybe it, 2S batteries are heavier, obviously, but mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know what? Speaking of, we have to give away some batteries at some point from Sun Padal USA this week. i uh, this this podcast, so you know what, Max, stay tuned, everybody. Max has got to think of a question that you have to get right in order to win some on road. Uh, actually, let me see what Hefty said he would send her. So, Max, your job is to think of a question that we're going to ask, and people are going to win these. They're going to win themselves a Do set they have of, to reply in the comments? Which I would say they have to reply in the comments. We'll take one from Facebook and one from YouTube. And you have to be right, and you have to say what you're going to win. So it's going to be a 55 MA, 5500 MAS 2S battery used for asphalt mod and carpet stock TC. Okay, so but you're gonna have to think of the question, Max. Think of the question. How many? How many? Actually, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure about this, but I'm not hundred percent sure. But the, how the many people still haven't gotten the first question that we did that last year. Nobody has gotten that right yet. Really? It was how many was national question? titles has Cavallari won? And that was his first one. Because okay, I have, I have, a, I have a question. How many world championships has been held uh, by the track next to the San Padel factory? That should be there we go. One. That should be easy. You have to you have to say that this is for winning some Sampadal USA 5500 2S batteries that you can use in asphalt mod touring car or carpet stock touring car. You have to answer that question in the YouTube comments. You have to say what you're going to win, blah blah blah, and where the and how many worlds. What was the question again, Max? So people know 
how many world championships have been held at the venue um, um, at the San Pedro factory? So there is this big venue next to the San Pedro factory, and how many worlds have been held? Jake, he's been venue? there too. Yeah, Jake, he's been there. So. All so, right. So, and if my world championships, no official ones. Okay. I, I have to. I have to check what is the correct answer to that question because I'm right. Not, you might want to get that right. And you, we're giving away two batteries: one for YouTube, one for Facebook. First person to answer Facebook, and you got to tag Sun Padal USA on Facebook. I don't have a Facebook. Just say Sun Padal USA fifty five hundred two S on road batteries, and then put the answer down below. There we go. Um, moving on. We was talking about smaller cars and all this type of stuff. Well, RC Madness been around for 30 plus years up there in the Northeast, up in Connecticut area. My buddy sent me a link where they had the 2023 Mini Nats. So basically uh, smaller, I guess, like the Mini Ts and all that type of stuff. They were racing them like on a carpet. Like the track was actually the size of a 10 scale track, but they were racing these these mini these mini tees they had over 200 entries just for the racing side of things then they also had some mini crawling going on with over 85 entries um is this a viable you don't i thought the track was too big you could have a smaller track smaller scale i remember when mini tees and all this stuff took off and got people back into race and mike hill always talks about it that's what got him back into racing as well is this something viable we can see smaller tracks you don't need as much space racing indoors getting people in there my buddy said he went there to check it out right he said it was just packed in there just people in the hobby shop buying stuff doing all it was it was he said it was he was blown away by how many people were there like mini z's no this is offer it offer mini what is what it oh but it's kyosho built cars no no all and they gave away a shook up bunch of stuff but this is like, yeah, like the low C mini tees. They have the they have the vintage oh, JRX yeah, 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 yeah. all okay, that type okay. of stuff. Like one sixteen, right? Yeah, yeah. Like oh, offered, okay, yeah, offered yeah. vehicles. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are actually like I I'm still amazed at how good those cars are because my buddy um, from Hobby Factory, we both worked there. He still works there, and uh, he's like one of those RC enthusiasts. He likes anything mm-hmm. RC. So he has one of those mini tees and we often, he, he has mounted like a VR cam on it and everything. So he often just sits in his office and goes drive around, go drive around the store. Anyway, we often drive, drove it on the track, like 10 scale off-road track. And that fucking thing could do all the jumps. Uh, it went like fast as hell. It's crazy. Like I, I don't understand how that thing is so good. Um, like 116. Um, and this is like not not to like say Lowe's is the best or whatever because we obviously know <laughs> his dance on uh, Lowe's. But th- that one buggy, I have to take my hat off for. It was a hit. Yeah. Even when they first released it, it was a giant yeah. hit, the mini T and all that stuff. Yeah. But maybe this is a way for people to get uh, get more into racing, I would say. So yeah, but I don't know how much okay, cheaper that, it is, but that's like Mini Z. I think Mini Z is a great gateway drug as well. Yeah. That all being said, I don't I don't really see it becoming like a popular class because ba- yes, you can run it on an off 10 scale track, but it's a little small, you know? It it is a little small. And in the end like if you buy an RB10 uh, or I think TLR makes a 10 scale RTR too. So just not to shit on them, <laughs> but please don't, we don't need any, yeah. any notices. Yeah. But basically like any 10 scale RTR, I think it's, it's overall a better purchase. Yes. Those mini T's are definitely impressive and I'm definitely a fan of them, but I don't see it as useful in the end um, because 116 isn't a class anymore. It used to be in Finland. We had a 116 off-road series. That was actually crazy, but no, it wasn't a class anymore. until that happened though. So you never know. Smaller yeah. area, it's cheaper parts. It, it has a lot of, uh, attraction. yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I, I like it too. Actually, one thing I want to say is in Finland, there's this new thing, new craze. I'd, almost say of GT cars, like 112 GT class, because that's like, like with effective. the realistic body on it. 
Yeah, like a GT body GT, on, yeah, yeah. on a yeah. pan car, basically. Mm-hmm. So that is actually quite nice because you can run on a very small track, like basically, let's say two quarters uh, of an on road track. Well, actually, American on road tracks are quite small to begin with, but you know, a small on road track, basically, and you can run on it. Um, you can even run like stock pan cars. If you are a little bit adventurous, you could run maybe modified pan cars too. But but this is a popular class in America too. The GT12 that you're talking about, or GTA, GTV, or I can't remember what they call. But it's a very popular class. It's very cheap. You can throw on a a realistic looking body, Mm -hmm. and it's 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 actually pretty big in the USA. Yeah. So I feel I feel that that is also an interesting class for beginners because. You can buy a high-end car, a high-end pen car, you know, but still it's sort of a quite of a beginner class in 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 a sense. So I like that uh, about it. I've been praising different weird classes at this podcast. I don't know why. Hey, you know why? You're finally becoming eclectic. You're not just focused on eight scale nitro buggy. No, I I've always been like that, but um, I don't know. I've kind of gone to a point where I see. Like people don't really know what they're doing because there's lots of like classes right now. Like if you go to an eight scale race, at worst there's like six, not really. Well, five five is like the worst amount of uh, classes. Like not not talking uh, like classes between like intermediate sports, but like different cars. You mean different vehicles? Different vehicles, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think so, well, at an eight scale race, it's gonna every big eight scale race is gonna have e truggy, e buggy, nitro buggy. That's it, truggy. So those are the four classes you're gonna have. Yeah. So then you you're gonna have, have the different variants of different yeah. intermediate. And PN, PNB used to have um, short course trucks too. Yeah, that was also uh, always insane. And they had mini like, truggy at that, some point. <laughs> really? Yeah, they did. Mini they did. truggy. Yeah. What is that? The truggy that like Techno released. The oh, it's like a mini, mini, mini okay. it's a 10 scale yeah. truggy, four wheel drive truck. It was yeah. it was it was it was the rage for a little while, but that no other like, companies really made any tr- trucks to yeah. compete with it. It was uh, kind of a fad, to be honest. Yeah, it's kind of slid on. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about PNB and up and coming races. Uh, real, let's all right. So enough about that. Let's get on to the juicy news that we got this week. Uh, we're going to save the if more question for the last. We're going to be our f- final thought. Uh, drivers getting out of RC. So first off, I am hearing from everybody, from people in Australia that McBride is out. Like he's going ghost. He's done with RC. He's not. The last post was back in January eighth about ch- a big change, and he hasn't done anything since. I heard at at DNC that he literally had a room, flights, everything booked, last minute canceled. And um, but we still have not heard an official announcement about McBride being out of RC. So as for now, he's still in RC, but the rumor is that he's out. But we can't yeah. really say nothing to them. But uh, Tebow announced his retirement yesterday, or was it yesterday or the day before, from professional RC or big, big racing, big RC car races uh, at the end of this year. Um, I kind of knew this was happening anyway. Uh, he's been one of the guys that have been closest to retiring from competitive racing, I think. And he's going to be on her. I talked to him yesterday. He's going to be on her after PNB, so we'll talk about it a little bit more. But uh, I think he, I think Tebow just kind of wants to do JTP RC, spend time mm-hmm. with his family, and I think what he's realized is that to be as to be competitive at this level now probably is going to require more time from him outside, like you know, time that he isn't ready to commit anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, to be on, I. Look, saying that he looked super impressive at at DNC, but I think he's just getting to that point where he look the man's bit put twenty three years in, you know, and mm-hmm. a lot of people will say, "Well, this is the best job in the world." I'm look, don't get me wrong, I'm sure he's enjoyed his job and everything, but it comes to a point at some point where you're like, "I just want to chill out and be with my family and not be at a race two, well, probably last night, probably down to two weekends a month." But I'm pretty sure at some point he was doing three, four weekends a month. At a race, especially when he's doing ten scale, and yeah, a lot of people I, have to understand that's that's three 
to full of your weekends every month dedicated. Yes, we love this and we geek out and it's fun to us. It's still a job. And I think if it's anybody, I think Ryan Lutz deserves this. I would say even Cavallari deserves this, but I don't think Cavallari has been smart on the other side of business side, like making a brand for himself. But mm. those, those guys deserve to kind of ride off in the sunset, I would say, and still make, um, like still be relevant, like still have their name be relevant to, to sell stuff and work in the industry. I, I hate when people like this disappear. How many, how many world champions have disappeared completely from RC? You know, just or fade to obscurity. Yeah. You know, or yeah. or like horror, like horror, horror didn't know when to stop. Like you know, and then he went from mm-hmm. car to car to car, and then that just degrades you. Yes, it's always still gonna be a legend, but yeah, the final years are always gonna be remembered as uh, you know, he did this. The only thing that this man can say he did, he hasn't really won. He hasn't won a, a eight scale world championship, but neither has. Cavallari or Mayfield as of yet. So, mm-hmm. and we're never going to see three guys come in like these guys were. I don't think we're ever going to see that ever again in RC. So, but I do think this, I do think he's going to do, I think he's going to be like Tom Brady and I think he's going to get the itch and he's probably going to do one or two big races next year. I just have a feeling that he'll do that. I'm going to ask him. Yeah. I'd, I mean, to be honest, I, I kind of think he is going to still, you know, do big races, but he won't be like, oh, I need to be a full-time pro, you know? Well, I think he's also going to be transitioning into the business side of things. And a yeah. lot of people are asking me, what does this mean for Mallorca? And I said, well, he's, a, he's still going to be the U.S. A lot of people don't understand that Robert and Tebow were not hired by Mallorca to win races. Yeah, I think... Crossed off the bat. Yeah, I think people kind of... People kind of, you know, thought that um, Robert and Thibaut were like, oh, Mayako wants to have, like, the best team of drivers and then them to win everything. But if you thought that, you, I, think, I mean, would you really hire two guys who are, like, closing in on 40 at this point? You know? Like, that's not... Near the end of their do. careers. Yeah. They are still fast, no doubt. But... You know, their priorities are going to change because like you said before, people say, oh, so it's the best job in the world. But when you, you mean, your only goal is to like win races so you can, you know, have your job, you know, get sponsors, get maybe get even some, you know, uh, price money or like. Yeah, uh, the pressure to make money like every yeah. week, every race. So is like-, like it's your your success as you know, a human in this society is tied into you winning these races. So the same way as when you go to work and you have to get shit done, these guys will have to win. And winning itself is very hard, you know, at this mm-hmm. level. Everyone wants to do that. Everyone tries to do that. And it's like that's why, you know, athletes retire sometimes like a bit early because it's it's a – very different, like, uh, state of mind, you know. Tebow has, what, three kids. He tries to run a company. You know, he wants to have a life with his family. He said that for years, you know, uh, that he just wants to, like, sp- spend more time with the family. And 100%, that was why he quit 10 scale. you know. That was probably why he didn't want to do it, to get, just have more time. And, uh, yeah, if, if, if I was Tebow... Um, uh, and I still, I was like, Hey, I want to win races. I would just keep going, you know, but the thing is he has other priorities. Like you, like, let's be honest. He was fighting for the win at DNC a few weeks back. You know, he was up there a few seconds behind the leader with uh, 20 minutes to go at the race. Okay. So it's not like he's quitting because he can't do good anymore or whatever, or whatever. He clearly, you know, has seen that he wants to do things differently. He just wants to, you know, stay home, do marketing, maybe travel to races here and there. Um, but, you know, that's it. He wants to spend time with his family and all that. So I think that's all that is about it. And then to people saying, you know, oh, Mayako hired these guys to do sales. Robert, when when Robert was hired, 
it didn't say on his announcement, oh, Mayako hired a new top driver. It said Mayako has a new head of motorsport, you know, head of scale motorsports, or what his title is, you know. And inside Mayako, um, uh, Robert is spearheading like the junior program Mayako has. Um, he's organizing a lot of the invisible speed slash Mayako MPC stuff. So it's not like he's, he's Dude, doing, he's busy. you know, he's, he, busy. he's doing, he's doing a lot of things and not like that has nothing to do with like him racing. racing. Dude, I yeah. watched this man on his phone the entire time and so- and maybe it's in South America. Mm-hmm. So his, like, I think the goal for Tebow is to do a little bit more local races, not yeah. be in Auto Town for so long, focus on Invisible Speed, Mayako, JTP, maybe do yeah. some other stuff in the full scale. I'm sorry, in the real world. Look, man, people have to understand this is fun. I love this and all this type of stuff. But for these guys, it's 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 a job. It's like anything else. It's like anything mm-hmm. else. And you have your good days, you have your bad days, you have your days you don't want to be there. And you have your time that you're away from family. And a lot of people when you when you go away from your family a lot, that's when you start realizing. Not don't travel as much as these guys, but I travel quite a lot last year, and I've been away from my family up to six months to a year, working and stuff like that. When you do stuff like that, you miss your family. You want to be around. You miss a lot of things. How many birthdays, anniversaries, this, all this other stuff he's missed. You can't get that back, you know. So these, it, it, it's just like as these guys get older, they mature, they have families, they realize, hey, all that traveling, all that being under pressure, isn't what I like anymore. I don't want to put in that work to be under that constant pressure all the time. I understand his decision. I hope it works out for him, but I have a feeling we're going to see him do Tom Brady and he's going to do some bigger races. It's it's hard oh, to get that competition out of your mind. Yeah, I'm. He, he, that's that's what that's what I wanted to say. Also, like it's it's always like these guys say, "Oh, I'm out," but like it's it's hard. To just go fully out, especially with Tebow, because his company he's trying to get running and operating. Um, he it's it's in RC, so you're gonna have you're gonna live the life of RC the whole time, and uh, all of that. So it's I I hundred percent believe he will do like maybe Roar Nats or some big race or something like that next year. We shall see, and still do quite well. <laughs> we we shall see. All right, I think that's it. We're going to talk about... We wish Tebow all the luck and Carl McBride and whatever they decide to do, by the way. But let's make it a good 2023. I hope he can win a race this year. I know that's what he wants to do. And I hope he can win a race this year as well. Um, All right, so upcoming races. We have quite a lot. These are coming up to like June. We have this weekend coming up. The NCT, J-Concept, NCCT 5 kicks off at the one RC1 Racing in Macomb Township, Michigan. Uh, I saw my buddy Kevin uh, La Chapelle. Or RC Kevin, he's headed down to that. Good to see him back racing. Also, this weekend we have the Northwest Northwest Rage Tour Finals up in Spokane. Big, uh, this is their big indoor series that they do up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Icebreaker, I believe this is like the thirtieth Icebreaker or twenty fifth Icebreaker at Indy RC. Tebow's going. That's is in Dallas, just outside of Dallas, indoor. Uh, Tebow's going there. A little bump be there. Wiggins is going to be there. Uh, we have the stock spec nationals coming up at PDX RC Underground. The GT8, we was talking about this GT. Is it GT8 pre routes? I would assume this is GP. Uh, like we said in the notes, a very underrated class, very fast and fun. That's coming up at the John Grant Raceway in New South Wales. Uh, the big race coming up very soon here is PMB. That's coming up next weekend. It's going to be packed. They released the track. They do have a joker lane. Uh, what? I'm going to have to accept that. But um, yeah. I, I I'm wish, not a fan of the Joker Lane. I hundred like, percent wish they just tried once to do it the other way around. Right, you know? that it's the longer route to go to the Joker Lane. You know, mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to be like it can be like let's say like five seconds or something. You know, it doesn't right. have to be long. It can it like all you have to do is basically make just like uh, some sand section or whatever, something that is hard to get through that sort of doesn't take up a lot of space. And so you just have to it's, do that like once, right? Yeah, something like yeah. that. Uh, because it's like from a from a, a spectator. It was very hard to follow. Very it's hard to like follow. there's no point in watching. It's like watching qualifying. Race. 
Yeah, it's like the whole time qualifying. you're just watching qualifying. So I, I, I know we're gonna. Don't. I know that we're, we're gonna get seriously criticized for saying this, but it's the truth uh, about that. Oh, yeah. But it's nothing we can do about that. So I'm I'm over the joke lane. The layout looks good. I'm expecting. I hope Bobby puts some big jumps in there. And another thing that Dave should, which I always say, Jay, Dave's showmanship is is on par. Like it's number one. He he likes yeah. to put on the show, and it should like with the jump. Like he has the like jumbotron there. But now, which I think is really cool, is that he's going to put it across. Like he's got uh, a bunch of seventy-five inch uh, screen television screens that's going to go across the front of the driver stand. I think that's actually pretty cool, um, and I look forward to seeing like it's going to have rolling advertising. Like you can have anything on there. You could be watching the race there if you wanted to. So I think that's cool. Uh, Live RC is going to be there. Uh, um, I think Dan is even good. I think Dan is going to help out with editing and stuff. So he is putting a lot of focus into the broadcast side of things here. So I look forward to seeing all of this. I will be watching PNB. I think it's going to be packed. I think every top yeah. driver is going to go. I don't know if Tessman's going, but it'll be good to see. That starts next weekend. Uh, we'll be posting all that stuff up there. Um, I'll have Tebow on after, and I don't, we'll we'll make picks next week. We'll make once I I want to see the track, what it looks like, and all that yeah. stuff, and we'll make picks. Um, all right. So after PM, oh, so going on, on the same weekend as PMB, my boy Adam Ross told me about this Canadian on road nationals. It's at a mall, like we're talking in a mall. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's in Canada. All the top US guys are going. They have like quite a bunch of entries as well. Uh, I see Scotty is teamed up with the guys at Robin Hood. They're going to do a big 10 scale race. There. Scotty is big. Dude, that guy is busy. He is bi- like every weekend he's doing something. So that's good to see. Easter GP at Brookthorpe, I believe, still on. Uh, we have the NXC warm up in Denmark coming up next month as well in April, as long as well as the North GA shootout by Mark Moon. And we have the Philippine Masters coming up near the end of April. So I believe it is the exact end of April to the weekend before. Silver State. Uh, then we have Silver State. And then we have IBC, which I still might go to. So we shall see. Um, yeah, I think we got through that news pretty quick, Max. Uh, I think we should go on to some of our Beach RC bench racing questions. We don't have much. We do have some. Uh, and we will come back after that and after our interview with Clayton, because that is our interviewee this weekend. We'll do our, our IFMAR question. Um, all right, Max, I think it's time to go on to the Beach RC Bench Racing Q&A. BeachRC.com, the racer's one-stop online hobby shop. Choose from all the popular brands and variety in stock with super fast shipping and great customer service. BeachRC.com still has the local hobby shop feel with all the benefits of the internet. BeachRC.com is the exclusive distributor for Ultimate Racing, JQ Racing, Pro Circuit Racing Tires, Nitro Lux Fuels, and Assault RC Performance Products. So fill up your cart and check out at BeachRC.com today. And thank you to BeachRC and Brent for all the support. I saw Lucas made a post today that the Beach RC White Whale trailer will be at uh, at PMB. Get your pre- he said they get your pre-orders on and have everything in there waiting for you. But go check them out when you get to PMB. Uh, and also we have an affiliate link if you guys want to use it. it helps us out uh, greatly. Appreciate it. It's in the written description of this podcast. First question comes from Aaron Bullock: Shorty or full size packs for e buggy and e truggy? Man, them shorties are getting real popular. Some put out USA makes a great shorty pack, by the way. That was a good one. That was good. Um, I, that one. I think I'm not, I haven't driven any truggy, so I don't know. But mm-hmm. these days, um, you definitely don't need full size uh, 2S packs. That's kind of like, there is, really isn't even a class which uses like full size 4S packs. Like most, most brands, however, at least, well, some brands make this um, LCG. For aspect, so that's one option you can have. Um, the shorty pack running. is nice, though. The shorty pack is definitely something I choose, though, because you can run the same pack in four wheel drive, ten scale. How about in handling drive, wise? 10 scale. Handling wise, it, it if you're running a full size forest, 
then the weight difference is quite drastic. So it's almost 100 grams mm -hmm. uh, or maybe even over. Um, then if you're running one of those LCG uh, full like full length packs, that's going to be, I believe the difference is, uh, well, it depends on the brand. It can be 50 grams, but it can only be like 20 grams. But yeah, shorty is always the lightest option. And with these new cars, uh, most of them you can't even run that uh, other than shorty packs, like associated e-buggy. Mm. You can only run a shorty pack. With e-truggy, you can run uh, the long pack. Um, but yeah, I think Mugen also, you can run a long pack, but it's a little bit difficult. Uh, HP okay. and Mayako and S-Works, I think you can run. Okay. Next question comes from my buddy Kevin Mendez. What's up, my brother? How you doing? Hope everything's well up there in Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island. Sorry. Uh, what he asked: Why do you have to cut the back parts of the chassis side guards in order to use the starter box on the on the MX-8? Will this be revised and the new side guards be made? Since a lot of guys are cutting, I have no idea because I haven't even gotten that far with my MX-8. <laughs> yeah, you still haven't built it. Well, um, the clips are built. Okay. Well, um, so you can make the starter box work with, with the side cuts. I used to run them, but the reason we cut them is for uh, just saving weight because really you don't like Kyosho is the only brand I think which still uses those side cuts that go all the way back. Most other brands just use them open in the back. So um, I think. I think we're coming out with. But he says this guards. is affecting the starter box or something. So I guess this is. Yeah, it, yeah. Basically, most starter boxes you have to do some modifications to get the car on um, with the standard side guards. So when you cut them, it's very a lot easier to do. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I suggest just cutting them. It's not like you can just take Lex and scissors and cut them. It's not that big of a thing. Okay. Benjamin James, thank you, Benjamin, for your help this weekend. He's helping us out with some topics as well throughout the week. This may be controversial one, but would it be benefit the sport if there were fewer races? Like keep the weekly club, keep the the weekly club racing, and have say one quarter the number of big races. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Yeah, 100%. absolutely. There's no question about it. I think the Every big race issue wants to be a big race now. Yeah, that's definitely the big issue. It's that every race needs to have like 20 different classes like open sportsman uh intermediate and then you have like 40 plus so you have plenty of classes um then you always try to make it like a big race like the tnr race for example they they had the idea was that yeah maybe a few hundred people show up but then they ended up having like 700 entries um like everyone wants to be a big race because that's how you get a lot of money, you know? So, and then people also have this sort of idea that if I go to a big race, it's somehow more worth it, which is actually the polar opposite. Uh, actually it's like, if you're just a hobbyist, it's better to go just a club race. But the issue with club races is they also try to do the same thing with like 10 different classes. Mm -hmm. So you end up having, you know, you end up having races where there's only like maybe 10 people per class, which is, it would feel like it's a small event, you know, if you ended up just combining the classes together. So you have one nitro buggy class, you have one e-buggy class, one truggy, one e -truggy, you know, that's all you got. You know what? That, too? that would make it feel like a much bigger race, even though there aren't that many people there. But you know what? Not... Look, back in the day, you had a few big races, you know? Obviously, back in the day, it was like DNC, Silver State. They had like a gas state champions, nationals, some other off races, eight scale. Now, it's so many races out there. And every race wants to get pro guys there or, you know, bring Adam Drake there, which is fine. Oh, that's fine. But it's okay for that race to just be about regional people too, you know? Mm -hmm. And just be like a bigger race there. As well, it doesn't have to be out there competing with the PMBs or the DNCs. Those races are on a different level altogether, right? Yeah. But I think what we're seeing, we are seeing a start moving where people are like, well, I'm not choosing to go to these big races and stay more closer to home. 
there's so many different levels of races too. You can have regional races yeah. that are big, you can have national races. But I definitely think. I mean, just think about it. Like, I remember when David was trying to plan dates for RCGP, how difficult it was. So even if yeah. somebody wanted to start a series right now, it'd be so difficult to get a free date. Like, even if you wanted to get a series going with the top professional guys and you're paying them, it would be hard. They would they would be like, well, I need to... Do... It's, it's, it's so much racing going on. Yeah, and that's definitely an issue. You know, everyone, everyone wants to go... And... Now, the big issue is also the fact that there is basically two organizers in America who have these big races. So there's race time and then there's the dirt, you know. No one else organizes big races anymore. TNR, yeah, they have that big race now. There are other places too, but there's, like, for instance, there's lots of really good... I always go back to Lance because his is all just local Floridians. That's it. Mm -hmm. All local Floridians from Florida... They, it, it doesn't have any big names. It It's a booming. It does great coverage. VIP tents sold out. He just had a banquet. He gave away a lot of stuff. Congratulations, Jess. I saw you won a uh, techno buggy. Gives away a lot of stuff. The other good race, the only thing I don't like about it is that they combine 10 scale and, and 8 scale, and I don't like that. Makes for long days. Is series is up in the PNW, which is this Northwest Ridge. And that's actually in a rented out arena and they i understand look they need to have interest to pay for the arena i'm sure the arena isn't cheap mm -hmm. but i think if we see and even now like people go to jbrls and now we, i saw a meme of jbrl and like the notch series or something so there there's so people do, there's a lot of club racing going on but i think that we've said it before a lot of people won't club race or won't go around their cars two weeks three weeks prior to a big race one because of money two they don't want to rebuild it or thrash their car before that. People still do, but yeah, I definitely think there's too many races. And and then these pros are just I I, I look, I always say this big entry races, all this stuff, they ain't going nowhere because I believe this is what people want. But fundamentally, I agree with Joseph on a lot of things what he says about capping races and doing all stuff. But I fundamentally I agree. I wish that these manufacturers would agree on five races to send everybody. Everybody goes to these five races. It could it could be, or it could be four. It could be, look, two in America, two in Europe, one in a specific location. I, I just want to see, I would I would just like to see that happen. Like, I don't know. Just everybody agree. But definitely too many big races. I don't want to get on that whole, that soapbox, but I would agree, Benjamin. Definitely too many races out there. I wouldn't be trying yeah. to plan a series right now. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, just to like put my thoughts together on that it's the the issue isn't that um the issue isn't that there, there's too many races that's fine you can have races uh around uh, the country all you want the issue is that everyone has this idea that, that we are gonna do a big race and then you know uh they just want to get a piece of the you know pie so Race time, what they did, they just bought out the competition. They bought every other race out, you know, so that they can organize it and collect the profits. And the dirt, they kind of did the same thing. But to be honest, Steel Rush Day wasn't really going to happen without Joey, uh, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason why it switched. Okay. So that to me is the biggest issue. And why is it an issue that there's only two organizers? One is for lack of competition. There's no point to improve. People will keep going to your events because you are the biggest events. You, you'll get your name out there because there's most people attending your events and everyone tells everyone, like, hey, you should go to this event. Even though the, the event, event might have some issues, when there's no competition, those issues don't come to light. Um, and, yeah, maybe in Florida, people are like, I don't want to go to, you know, whatever. Well, a, lot of people, race them. a lot of people in Florida have just... Like, for instance, that Buggy Land race mm -hmm. that they had uh, did not sell out. But I yeah. guarantee, okay, it's, it was $100. It was more than that race. But I guarantee you, I think Lance is going to have a race there and it will sell out. Yeah. Because they, a because... lot of Floridians have just chosen to do that race because they like it so much. I'm sure yeah. it has its issues too. I'm sure it doesn't please everybody. 
while people choose to go through this. And you know what? Like the amount of effort and I re- I imp- like I if I would implore Lance McDonald to make a series, an American series where it could where like just make full races and try and get the top names yeah. there. Because what he does, what he's doing, like he understands that the coverage is great, pictures is great, banquets, all this stuff. He's giving so much back to the races. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And not only that, like people can go and say, Hey, look, you can go watch my race and do this. And you know, and, and I'm watching it and I'm just watching it grow and I'm watching it sell out. But I mean, I would love to see him try and do a series, but he's he's smart. Like if he goes out and does try to do a big series somewhere where he's going to have to rent places and it's just, he's not going to be able to do it as cheap. And he knows that. So it's to keep yeah, it in Florida. And if races tracks that, you know, keep it a Florida yeah. race. Maybe more people can follow an example, but he puts a lot of emphasis. I think Lance compared to a lot of, okay, we're starting to see a shift in, in the bigger promoters. Like uh race time is now putting more focus on their, on their, on their broadcast, which is great. Joey still kind of is like, yeah, you, you're going to have to come. And do it. I don't think he's yeah. paying for it. I understand that, but I mean, if Lance can do it with his Florida RC series and do not just like like do a good job, like pictures, all that type of stuff, yeah, it's good. All right, let, we beat that horse to enough. Let's go on to Eugene Jonathan Homer from Sri Lanka. Just be just believe that there has to be a system for people to enter races like F three, F two, F one. They have that at the BRCA uh, Federation. He goes, this will give rookies time to race and win and come up the ranks. Now everyone who buys an RC car and has enough money to spend goes on the races and events in which my view is a disaster for the sport. I agree with Benjamin James on having less events, have one worlds where guys from RCGP, Femkos, and other, and other, other each country maintain a point system for their drivers. Send the, yeah, he, he's going, he support club events in member countries. He's, he's kind of going over the place. Um, yeah, I don't, I definitely agree with the F1 thing. They believe they do that in the UK. Like, I'm going to be honest with you, man. The BRCA is probably the best association in the world, like better than EFRA. And I, yeah, I put I EFRA up there high, but, uh, yeah, I think that has to happen. But like, if you're Dean and Roar, they got to start, like I'm talking to Clayton. He's, he's like, I can't believe how much of the, from the beginning I have to start. That's what he told me to, on the, on the interview. Mm-hmm. That's how bad it was at Raw. Anyway, we'll, it's that's a never ending. Yeah, I think there's too many yeah. big races. But I think people are focusing on sort of the wrong things. It's not about creating the rules. You have to first create the organization. You have to yeah. first create a network where people come together, agree on, agree on stuff together. Like have the Roar president and Dave and Joey meet like once a quarter, decide on no, stuff. But for Joey like, and, and Dave, they have no incentive to join Roar. Oh, None. What's yeah, happening? they don't, and that's the issue. Like, but well, that's Ross' fault. Su- that's Ross' fault. That's oh, they, it fault. is. Oh, yeah. I'm not blaming Dave and Joey for it. Obviously, they could do it from the goodness of their heart, but it's like Ross' fault. Like that has happened. But oh, they know that. They if, know. In the perfect world, if you want to get good things done, you have to like organize and find a way to work together. I agree. And I agree. like that's the only way to go forward. I agree. It's even, uh, well, if, uh, people can listen to Clayton had some good ideas. All right, let's get on to some YouTube questions. Uh, he says, this one comes from Hellion RC. Besides putting in more laps, are there any techniques, tips, or drills to make practice more productive? I'm going to say one thing that I saw that worked when I was in South America. Simple thing of putting cones there and making people drive between the cones. It got to the point where they kept messing up one cone and some tracks, I would stand there. And I'm like, you hit me. We got issues. It's a joke. But I literally saw that cone thing really help people. Because you you think you're on the inside, right? You think you're on the inside and you're carving tight lines, but you aren't. So you get on that cone and you got to go around them, go in between them. Uh, you and Do you have any suggestions for people that are going to practice? I know JQ says practice five minutes sets. Five minute mm-hmm. sessions, but is there something that you part in particularly may go out and focus on uh, or try to fix while you're driving in that five minute session that make you better? Yeah, so there is definitely make a sort of a plan what you're gonna do that day. So when you go out to a new track, especially and you're just practicing. For Americans, it's a bit different because most of them just go club racing. For Europeans, people just go out and practice. So it's a it's quite of a different thing uh, for many. 
So if you're going to collaborate somewhere, um, that's going to be always more difficult. So most of the time, you're just going to have to know that you have and set up, learn the track by driving. But when you're practicing, you have uh, like just going out to practice, you have more tools at hand. So the cones are a good thing, but I think most of the times it's hard to do if you're at the track by yourself, you know. And if if there are other people at the track like driving, then you really can't do it. So if you're just that you go to the track by yourself, um, what I I usually do is I go out to the track, drive a few tanks, get a feel, you know, that kind of like a shakedown for myself too. Get off the track, clean the car, check that everything is, you know, good. And then, you know, go to drive a five-minute run. Don't push, don't do anything crazy. Just try to get through a five-minute run. Go fuel, five-minute run. Do that like two times. And if you have got like a good feeling, like, hey, I can do a five-minute run, then you like um, start to push more. And one thing I always suggest is don't do too long uh, in a row. Like, don't do, like, more than three, five-minute runs in a row. I think that's a good thing, too, because a lot of times if you drive too long, you just don't focus anymore. So keep force yourself to focus on it. Keep the things short. When you feel like, you know, um, you have a good, you know, you can make five minutes on that lap, then you start to find, you know, different lines and whatever. Sometimes what I do is... I have done those like two to four initial five minute runs sort of to get my base speed. Um, if if there's something I want to change my car, then uh, I do it in, you know, after the two first runs. Um, and then like after that, I do a tank or two, just not, not the five minute session, just looking for different lines, basically trying to do a best lap but within reason, you know, don't push too much, but just try to find different lines, drive like lap by lap. And then like, once you start getting quick laps in succession, just try to keep that rhythm, you know, then what you do is you do a last like five minute run. So basically what I usually do is I do two runs of just pure shakedown, go to the pits, clean the car, get in the mood uh, of like, hey, today's a practice day. Then I go out, do a few five-minute sets uh, to get my sort of baseline of what I'm working with. Um, Then either I do one last tank where I push really hard and then I don't do that last tank. Go to the pits, clean the car, blah, blah, blah. Then the next time out, Usually, I, I always start out with a five-minute run because that gets you focused and in the mood. But sometimes after those two initial sets of one, just to learn the track, the second session to do five-minute runs, get your base level. And then the third session, what I do is I do a five-minute run. Then I kind of do those, you know, seeking the best lap, seeking different lines. And then I do a five-minute run after that. And then... I get into the mood of I can do the same five minute run continuously. Uh, then I will start like testing stuff out. Obviously, throughout this process, if I feel there's something holding me back in the car, I go and change it. But I don't try anything. I don't know what that will do. You know, I have in my mind. I have like okay, if my rear end is doing this, I will do this. If if my front end is doing this, I have this thing I can change. You know, I have a few tools in my setup which i can adjust that i know like if the track is a little different i can get it get into the groove and then once i've found that i have sort of found the lines i like i i can do five minute runs consistently then i start testing out stuff that i don't know before you know like in these conditions could it work that i'll like raise the arm and go to thinner springs or whatever the change is like something that you don't know the end result of you do. Okay. I'm giving you a timeout. You're yeah, going to I was, I was, science mode. Yeah, but it, I think that's, that's, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good formula. 
uh, for a day of practice. And that has worked definitely for me because yep. it's it's definitely hard to just go out and drive and try to find a setup and so on. Um, but the day of practice, I usually like a six hour set is, is pretty good. More than six hours is it's getting a bit tired. Yeah. If I, if I didn't stop you, you would have been through every adjustment on the car. I'm pretty sure of that. I just no, saw I it in actually, your brain. I was, I was actually wrapping it up. I'm but, sure you wasn't. Yeah. I'm sure you wasn't. But was then there, there is like gimmicks to do, like the, the cones. Well, I, I I don't know if gimmicks is a bad word, but things like kind of outside the box is the cones. That's a good thing to do. And then like forcing yourself to drive a certain light. That's also good. So speaking of that, uh, I'm telling him to do a video. I'm like, good, dude, that's got a video going. Then we could bring you on the podcast and we could show people what you're doing uh, with Pau and his training stuff that is doing with different yeah. drivers. Right. I'm like, look, we can talk about it, but let's show. I mean, I know you don't want to show everything to everybody, but you can show little things you're doing. I think, um, mm-hmm. I think that is pretty much the next step where people are going to start. Like I always say, we can't go out and lift weights and become a better RC car driver. Yes. Get being in shape and all that stuff. Being in shape is going to be good for you but it's not necessarily going to make you a better driver. But I think doing hand-eye coordination, different eye techniques, stuff like with all that, we should be like, as a pro driver, I think they should, people should be looking into this. I don't see anybody really doing it, but I think what, what Powell's doing with like Bartlett's Zalewski and those guys. And I think um, what's on the uh, Paulson's doing it as well. So it'd be interesting to see what comes out of that, because I think a lot of people oh. scoff at that, but I really yeah. think it helps. Yeah, I, I think perfect. if you are like, a, it depends really what your goal is. If your goal is just to have fun, mm-hmm. then there's, you know, you just go out there and drive and keep it so that the car works, you know. But if you want to become like an athlete, then there's a much more strict routine you should follow. One thing I forgot to mention is you always walk the track. Look at other cars go around the track. Because you're going to see that, hey, you can actually go much closer to the pipe there. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. actually, that that section of the track is a little bit tilted to one side. So you can trust the car turns better there. So the things like that you can't see from the driver's stand. That's one thing definitely to do, even on practice days. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, him, I can't read his name. Corn Dog, I think it is. Yeah, that's it. What racing class do you wish would make a comeback? He says, Nitro Stadium truck for me. I want gas truck to make a stadium uh, a comeback. But if you're interested in getting some, getting into gas truck, you can get one of the cool Ignite Design RC uh, conversion kits from Ignite Design RC. Link for that is in the written description of this podcast. Ooh, shameless plug. Um, I would love to see gas truck racing come back. But I think realistically, what's better for the industry and will get more people racing is let's bring short course back. If we could get really? short course, yeah, yeah, it's no, realistic. I don't like it. It's realistic. It's the truck. So our American friends, they love it. It looks real. Now I think it got a little away from itself when everything went to the racing side. But I mean, if we go back to that hardcore tracks, like I want, like that type of, you know, I know it's hard to say because everybody's going crazy, but on short course trucks and making them like just you know bigger buggies. But I think it's a great, it was a great entry level stock. I know a lot of people have stock slash, but I think for the best part of the sport, st- uh, slash racing or, or straw course, or what I like to see is real old school outdoor tent scale racing, like with freaking yeah. step pins and bow ties they do it and in, stuff. They do it in Australia. They do That's it in big, um, Florida yeah. and they do it up Pacific yeah, Northwest yeah. too, but they I mean, like on old school, Lermy, like dark flying. And then that will also be a great place for nitro truck. But seriously, for the betterment of the hobby and the betterment of the sport, uh, short course racing. Yeah, I think I think the issue is like uh, with 10 scale, the outdoor stuff is kind of over now. You know, it's going to be like, yes, you can definitely run outdoor dirt 10 scale with the layback, you know even a lay down uh, in some cases um, you don't need like a rear motor buggy for it, but hundred percent. I think because of the fact that people have realized that copper carpet is like the surface for racing. Um, 
in, even in America now, uh, it's kind of slowly like the low grip, low mist stuff is going to slowly die out. And that's why I don't see gas truck become like gas truck coming back as a like a racing class. But so these gas trucks are now because they're using modern geometry, modern parts, mm-hmm. they can now be raced indoors on these tracks as well with these cars. Yeah, that's that is true. But then then that they are nitro, there aren't many, you know, tracks mm-hmm. that you can yeah. race. Look, indoors. it's it's a niche class. It's a niche class. Yeah. I like it. I'm gonna have a night ignition yeah. truck. You guys should get one too. I, I like the that's that's one thing that really bums me out is is the fact that pinned 10 scale racing is gone because that's actually really, really, really fun. I really like uh, racing like that. I tell you what, r- what race I'd like to bring back hot rod shootouts at hot rod. Yeah. Like that, that's like, in my opinion, that's the best type of 10 scale. Mm-hmm. You know, there's like, I, I just don't, but I think the, the issue is kind of like, if you like running outdoors, you like dirt and stuff, the eight scale is like it's easier to get the car to have grip. Mm-hmm. It's bigger tracks, bigger jumps. You don't have to maintain the track as good. But then, if you want to run like a smaller vehicle, more agile vehicle, then indoors it's so much easier because the car doesn't get dirty. It's neat. You're in- inside. You don't have to worry about the weather. So I think it's just like in between classes, kind of. You know, it's mm-hmm. cool, but it's in between classes. And I think like gas truck is the same issue exactly. I'm right. well, moving on because we have quite a few more questions to go through. To another ten scale question, uh, Jen's okay. Wants to know thoughts on ten scale buggy firm racing and the differences between the quality on makers and their batches. I will admit I I don't know much about firm racing and offer it. I do know that firms are supposed to be better. The only race that I know about is Gone Bananas because I used to listen to Matthew Housen talk about that a lot. Uh, I think one of the big things with the firm racing tire thing is maybe jumping. You don't get that um, rubber expense expansion that you would get with rubber tires. Yeah. M- maybe I'm yeah. wrong. Any experience? Real quick, Ma- Max, do you have any experience with firm off-road racing? Not in the past few years, okay. to be honest. But I, I have I actually discussed with a few people who ran them mm-hmm. because in Sweden they do run it. They, they're mm. like, they, every race they run the foam tires. So it's kind of like high grip carpet, but the car is allowed to slide kind of like that. And they used to run in Sweden with carpet, but on slicks. So that mm. was also kind of a similar feel. Um, and also with foam tires, the plus is there's not a lot of tire wear, but obviously but you issues. can chunk a tire. Yes, you can ruin a tire. Yeah, so you can easily if you clip a pipe. You, if you have bad luck, you can easily like just a ruin tire because the foam clips off. That's one issue, and uh, yeah, there's all kinds of like little things that are uh, not that great about foam tires. If you're a foam tire racer, send us a message and let us know because I think he wants to know about the difference between quality and batches. And honestly, yeah. I don't know enough enough about that. Neither the all like to be honest, all I'm aware is like Hot Race makes a foam tire, but then ten scale off road. But I am not aware of other brands making. Yeah, there's an American yeah. brand called Gone Bananas. Yeah, I know that. But, there's a track yeah. like in a, in the USA, a copper track that you just run firms. That's it. You don't run any mm. other tire. Yeah. So in 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 Sweden. They're for the winter series or whatever, they use the foam tires and they use the hot race ones. I so think one of has this for selling there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or at least what I've heard, those have been pretty good. So, hot race probably like they have the most, at least in current like ten scale world, the hot race foam tires are in most okay. use. I'd expect. So, that's okay. probably the safest choice. Next question is from Kevin Holbert, and he wants to know, I'm looking for some new 10-scale buggies. Do I go X-ray or Team Associated? Here's what I'm going to say. If you're in America, I'm pretty sure everyone around, like, you're in a place where the Team Associated is popular because they're everywhere, and they seem to work pretty good. If you want to be different, go X-ray. But just remember, when it comes to getting parts or setup help, you're not going to have, I don't know what area in, you might have some X-ray people there as well. 
But I think there's definitely more associated people out there and associated avail- avail- availability of parts for associated is hot, is more. But if you really dead set on the x-ray and you like it and you want it, then you go get an x-ray. Yeah, I think it depends if you run if you run four wheel drive, uh, then X ray is probably a better option. It's easier. Mm-hmm. It's like from the box, it has a good setup on any surface really, and it's a good car. But it is more expensive, um, and um, the parts availability is worse. But for two wheel drive, it's hundred percent get an A. Uh, the X ray car is just. It's much harder to set up. Um, the AE base setup is pretty good for the tool drive, and you parts availability, all that kind of stuff, uh, like help from other people is going to be better with the AE, and okay. also it's most likely a bit cheap. Full drive, I think you should buy an X-ray, um, even considering the parts availability. But tool drive, no matter the situation, just buy AE. Okay. Uh- I need my glasses. But Basher Enzi, I believe he's from New Zealand. Who's going to Manila from Mayako? As I know, Robert and JQ. I, I believe, like, Augie is obviously, there's some Mayako guys there. But I don't know if any Australian or New Zealand guys are going at this point. Oh, there is. There is uh, New Zealand. Like, Bevan and those guys will go. I think Mark Johnson's yeah. going. Yeah, Mark so. Johnson and Bevan is going. Um, I am not aware. But it- Ronald Falk's not going. Because he's gonna Why? be he, he's gonna be in the Caribbean at uh Phil's wedding or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, something. So he he's he's got to go to that. But no, Ron Falk. But Robert's going and Joseph's going. I wonder wonder is there, if there's gonna be some everywhere Joseph goes. There's gonna definitely be yeah. some fireworks. It's Edward gonna, Cio Edward Cio and is Joseph. gonna kick his ass. That's yeah, and it's Ed, gonna be fun. Edward Cio and Joseph didn't have the best. Uh, Best you and jo- you, Joseph and Edward C. L. didn't have the best. Time. I don't know. I don't understand because I never did any. I barely even you are his, to Edward. You are Joseph. At that point, you're Joseph's serious Padawan. Yeah, I think I was just guilty by association. And if people don't know, Edward C. L. got his um, got his friends to like pour down molasses on our pits. I would have uh, poured it RCGP. all over JQ. That's what I would have done. Yeah, yeah. But it was like Joseph. Joseph was mad that they put so much molasses on the track because it got really like, really like slimy. The track it was a little too much, more than they like had designed earlier. And then like Edward got we we ain't gotta rehash that. all of that. We know yeah. what happened. I hope nothing. But happens. I was basically I, race... I was I was just like I was even helping them fucking build the track, and Edward Sio just pulled uh, like poured molasses on my pits. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think know. it was mainly I, I was, at you. I think it was mainly at JQ. I think what happened is they weren't sure at which part, which table Joseph was pitting, so they just hit both. <laughs> <laughs> um, new track. I I really want this race to get some coverage. I think it's uh, I I, I like to see some more American guys go there. I'll be honest with you. I know it's hard. It's it's expensive. It's far away, but hopefully it can turn into one of those races. Hopefully. Uh, and then our last YouTube questions come from our good friend, EKJ24000. Go check out his channel. Uh, my boy, Corey Jordan. He goes, forget all these same old questions. When you guys going to have Jeff Keaton on so you can discuss this beef you all having on Facebook? He says, that's the question. <laughs> I have no beef with Jeff Keaton. Look, let me tell you something. I am going to have Keaton on her. I don't think it's wise that you and Keaton get together because he doesn't respect you, never will. So it's just going to be like a shit fountain, like shit fountain versus max the whole entire time but what he does he does respect jq and he's the one man to piss off jq to the point where jq had to block him so i really like that um but i i think jeff Je- i know that jeff keaton wants to come on the podcast i know that and we're going to have him on and i will say this i do enjoy talking about american rc with uh jeff because he does know that pretty well i do agree with him on a lot of things but when he starts getting too shit fountainy, I just have to be like, all right, I can't, I can't, you know what I mean? But yeah. I, I think I'm going to just have him with me, him and JQ, because I think with you on there, it's just going to be a nonstop argument. It's probably going to be a nonstop argument with JQ and him, but then they'll find something in common, which we like something about Drake or something. Then they'll team up and they'll be like, then I have to worry about them getting in trouble. It's, it's, 
Like having Jeff know. Keaton on is, like, is and, and JQ is 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 not yeah conscious I to think, my good health. I don't know what Jeff Keaton has like against me. I don't really get it. Like I think I've he's never... like a lot of people that have things against you right now. You're a young guy. Yeah. Who's given who's like talking a lot about RC. And I think you just trigger middle age men yeah. around the world. I think, like I, I think it's just that like middle age insecure men don't really like hearing the truth. Oh my god. He's gonna hurt us and he's gonna go crazy. Yeah. I think it's just like insecurity because there's like also RC is like um RC, like let's be honest. Like this hobby is kind of like a made up for nerds and like, like, you know, nerdy didn't nerdy get Nerdy guys. Like, friends. yeah, I agree with you. Like we're all a bunch of nerds. Yeah. Like yeah. we geek nerdy out on this stuff, but really be high. Friends like... in high school uh, got, got, um, didn't ever make it in RC in any well, way. Well, let's put it this way. Let's just put it this way. In high school, I'm pretty sure being a fast RC driver isn't as cool as being this yeah. quarterback from the football yeah. team. But yeah. Jeff Keaton, we're going to have him on. I don't want to give it too much life, but I know that you and him will just argue constantly. See, this is the thing. A lot of first it was like people thought you was gay. Then you got a girlfriend. People, uh, <laughs> people like everybody's always questioning you. So I think people just like to hate you, which is fine because we need yeah. somebody like that. But there's yeah. lots of people that like you and, and enjoy your advice. And um, it just is. I mean, this is kind of if you look at the situation, it's what really happens in RC period, isn't it? Like young guys are always kind of, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just young. Mm-hmm. Even now to the point people are like, oh, yeah, Max always talks is good show. But I'm like, you do realize that Max won like intermediate or expert at DNC when it was really fast. You're, he's made PMB yeah. mains. He's remind you. I don't think you're, I'll be honest with you because you haven't been racing much and you've got other things going on, like a girlfriend and school and work. Maybe not as fast as you was or dedicated to racing back in as you was younger, but you also doesn't, know. it I, doesn't I, take away from what you've learned and what you know, and you've traveled yeah. and you've done all that stuff. And I think people, just can't grasp that. And I think it aggravates because mm. you're super cocky. I mean, look, professor of everything. And, <laughs> um, you know, and I think people, I think people just get triggered when you start talking. And yeah. if they just be quiet, I'm not saying you're always right, but you definitely bring up some good points. And when I start spacing out and I'm not listening to you, that means you're on a roll. But yeah. we're not, I don't I know. Think, we might yeah. have you and Keaton on. I just think it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just like, RC in a sense is kind of like uh it's 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 still like a small community, even though it's worldwide and there is it's very small, uh, people, it's still small. but it's it's like it's a small community. So like it's easy to feel like oh I'm I'm the man in the RC world or whatever. And then when there's like young people coming up or whatever, then that that gets under people's this skin. happens all the time. And, Max, people love to hate you. Enjoy it. Yeah. I want you. Go, I w- I really want you to come out and race because everybody thinks you're slow now. So get back yeah, racing. That's, that's that's actually one thing I wanted to say. It's crazy why people think I would be slower. Like last time I raced in America, uh, well, actually I raced at RCGP in 2019. You was not I very good at RCGP in 2019. Well, I was like seventh after qualifying. Yeah, but I you just Cavalier. did not want to be there. You did not want to be there. Yeah, well, I hadn't raced in two months. I had two days of practice before the race. I hadn't raced in two months. So that definitely wasn't like the best scenario. But I think, yeah, I haven't raced in a while. Abroad, you know what I think? I'm going Finland... to be honest with you. I think out of you three guys, you, Yona, uh, and Pekka, and I'm being honest, I think Pekka is the best driver. I didn't get the best um, setup and knowledge guy. I haven't seen you know drive or not enough. And I think Pekka is youngest of you guys, right? No, I think Yona is youngest. Really? But, yeah, Yona and Pekka is born in the same year, but Pekka is born like. But I, I, I don't know. It's weird because I keep beating them in Finland. Like, I, I beat both of them in Finland, but then like I haven't made big races recently, so I don't know. But well, that's what um, you need to make some big races. Hopefully you don't yeah. die at these races like you almost did recently. <laughs> and um you and you and Maddie G getting well, he got his spleen removed. You got your yeah, appendix removed, you know? Yeah. Um, 
But I hope you do get to some. I think that's what it is. You haven't been to no big races, but yeah, show these people that you yeah. can. You, you know how to drive. Yeah. Um, I think you're nice. I think you're nice by far the most talented of us three. Okay. But it's just that he he hasn't he doesn't get to practice as much. Like Pekko is Pekko practices like probably ten times more than me, <laughs> me and probably half as much as you So okay. that definitely is to his benefit. But he's he's definitely done really well recently. And he he's probably the most versatile of all of us. I would say that. Honest. I would say yeah. that. All right, we have a few more questions and we're gonna move on. My but good friend Peter Bartel is Ismo the comedian a national hero in Finland? Not really, <laughs> not really. That's the thing. Like, um, for if you have any German listeners, you probably know like Sunrise Avenue, like a huge band in in Germany. Uh, it's a Finnish band, but then when like in Finland, like yeah, we know about it, but it's not a huge thing. Um, Finland's a hard crowd, I would say. You guys don't seem yeah. to be impressed by much. Yeah, it's it's like and uh, like Ismo, for example, he's very big in America, but he never broke through in Finland. Like he was, he was a decent sized comedian I, in Finland. I have no idea, who but he, he is. wasn't. Well, he's like, I think he had a spot at Conan and like big shows like that. No idea. I'll go Google him. He's like, he's a stand up comedian. Okay. He has all those uh, bits about English language and all that. Type okay. Of Zach Ryan, Zach will be with me next week. We're gonna catch up on everything, everything Australia and RC. If Ke- if Femko was running the forest or under a bridge, but no one was there to witness it, was it the really a Femka? <laughs> <laughs> Tell you, man, like I did not know this race was happening. Uh, Ron Chang, happy birthday to you, man! Happy birthday to Ron Ron Chang. Uh, hey Max, when you set up a completely new car, do you have an order of what you set up first, second, and last? Max, no science mode on this. Okay, um, it depends, really. Uh, the best course of action is to measure up the car first. Uh, that's what I've been doing with uh, Mayako and uh, Associate when I joined. And with 10 scale cars, I haven't driven much, so I haven't done that. But that doesn't really help you unless you have prior knowledge of it. But Kind of having an idea of where you're at. That's always what I start out with, measuring things out. Then um, I usually look at other people's setup, start out with someone else's setup, um, and then sort of see what can be improved. Um, With the Mayako, for example, I started out with pretty much the setup run a fog run uh, at DNC and then I slowly you know tried the things I know can make the car better you know like um, increased wheelbase and lower towing which I know I generally like um, what were some of the basics you would change for us I think that's probably an easier question for this for like I'm a beginner right what do we, what do I change for us what would you change for us as a beginner as well, tell me what I would be- change for us well, it really de- that's that's the hard like uh, part about it because it really depends on what you're starting out with. So uh, you should be on the right tires, right? Well, yeah, I okay. would say get right the tires. Basics First off right. the bat, so yeah, right tires. definitely make get sure. The you, oh, right. here's the basics that a lot of people don't get is make sure everything's working right on your car. Throttle linkage, yeah. all that stuff. Endpoints are set. Um, you gotten your, your EPA is set, so you're getting full throat. All that stuff. All yeah. that stuff seems simple. Mm-hmm. But I swear, I have, I have, every time that I watch Joseph do this, he, he calls it unfucking cars. He has to unfuck car. Even from the best mechanic. He, you know what's funny about that situation is the worst mechanic usually has the best one. Best car of them all. Yeah. So it's crazy how that is. The guy who knows everything usually is missing, just forgetting the basics. So that's it. Um, Having those tires, having that temperature mm-hmm. wise. You got to go like, that's another thing people don't understand. Ambient temperature means a lot. If it's hot outside, you're going to want thicker shock oils, right? If it's cold outside, you're going to want thinner. It's simple, right? But people forget that. Um, So basic things like that, you got to just take that into consideration first. Then you can start making your little fine tunes. Like maybe you raise a link, lengthen a link or move positions. Go out there and feel it. To say what really works 
it's hard. You have to. I think yeah. one of the things that people realize is that you have to go out there and put in this time to learn that. Yeah. You know what it's I mean? hundred percent. It's, it's, if you like always the safest way to go is to look at what other, other people run. Don't look at just like what Spencer Rivkin runs. Look at like what all the associated guys run and then be like, okay, they all seem to run the real link at this position. So you do that, you know, that's like the stock position. If they have some differences in like front kick up, which uh, at least at the associated time, there was many people running that differently. Then that you kind of figure out for yourself. But yeah, I kind of went straight on to set up, but 100% the, the biggest issue people have when they switch the, switch the brand is they don't set up the car, right? Like they don't, they tune the brake wrong. They tune the throttle EPA wrong. They tune the steering EPA wrong. All those stuffs matter much more than the setup. If those are wrong, it's going to feel wrong. Another mistake. Oh, I set, I set up my car. I set up my Kyosho like my Mugen. Yeah. Yeah. I hate when I want it to be like, well, if that's what you want, you'll get it. Like, yes. Yeah. It's so many things. Uh, but I would say after he's done the, like, you give me, Real quick, three basic things you would do right off the bat. Um, put time and effort into figuring out how the brakes and the steering linkages work. So okay, that's if those one. are different, that's one. Um, I'm not going to say tires because well, it's not. That's obvious. Obviously, that's obvious. Um, number two is look at other people, how they run the car. What seems to be the common themes of how they run the setup? Okay, and follow that. And then number three, don't go crazy on some specific hop-up parts like pistons, um, springs, and... um, Oils. Yeah, pistons, springs, oils. Make sure they are right, like right for your condition, and that should be it. Don't go buying like... Okay, one thing is like if there's a separate... Uh, like arm holder, definitely, that everyone runs, definitely get that. If there's a different shock tower where the shocks are four millimeters higher, don't bother with that at the beginning. But make sure that if there's like suspension mount parts, like low, like arm holders or like some hubs or like knock, like axle heights, those kind of things make a quite a big difference to the car. So those Focus on those if there is different ones that everyone runs and says you need this. Absolutely. Those you should get. Apart from that, focus on springs, pistons, and oils. That you got them right, and then you should be good. Then you can start fine-tuning some link or, like, if you should go heavier in the center, different light on the front. If that's, like, like, preference things. But try to find a good baseline to start out from, and then, you know, go into a direction you like. Don't go try and doing anything crazy. Don't like. Don't start out with a car like, "Hey, I like short link on my Mugen, so I probably will like short link on your Kyosho." No, it's a completely different rear end geometry. It's not gonna work the same way at all. So don't even bother thinking that way. Okay. Our last question, and we're gonna try to keep this short, but I think it's gonna be a good. It's a good question. And Alan Smith wants to know what form of RC is most difficult, 10th scale offered or 10th or 8th scale offered and why? I think, so here's my opinion. I think 10th scale two-wheel drive is extremely hard. I think on carpet, it's fairly easy. I, I enjoy it on carpet. I don't know if I've never driven on slicks on, on this type of wet clay. I enjoy watching the racing, but it looks hard, right? But I think that eight scale, I think eight scale racing is easy for everybody to get around a track. I think it's easier for a person to get around a track with an eight scale car the first time out than it is for a person to get around a track with a two wheel drive car the first time out. Right. Mm. But I think that once you get right into eight scale racing, I think overall eight scale nitro buggy racing, I think it makes you a better racer altogether. Not, yeah, yeah. not just like farting around, you know, but I, I see, I think, to say which one's harder, though, I think what makes nitro racing harder is the 
the things that are out of your control, like the time. Like you, mm-hmm. instead of five minutes, you got forty-five minutes or an hour. You got pit guys that you have to rely on. You have so many things that could go, wrong, so many moving things that could go wrong in eight scale mm-hmm. nitro. You know, compared to ten scale, and you, you people still manage to do that and do sixty minute mains. Not to mention the hits and and everything they take and the tire decoration and the oil and just everything that they go through, all the heat generated from the engine and muffler over an hour, like. All that stuff counts. Yeah, and it's 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 not only that actually. It's um, so my answer to this would be uh, nitro buggy. I think it's the most difficult class. Like like let's say if you're driving a car for the first time, driving an RC car for the first time, and you're on like dirt with a tool drive with a lay down gearbox. Yeah, that's going to be very difficult. You probably aren't going to get around the track. But considering you have all the things set up right. I'd say eight scale nitro is the most difficult. And actually, uh, like I know my dad listens to this podcast. So he was a great example of this because he ran one race with my practice car, uh, uh, with a nitro car. And it was like, yeah, he did pretty well, to be honest. But um, it was very difficult for him. You know, he, he had a tough time like doing the jumps. Uh, getting the feel for the throttle because of the clutch and then you sort of have to prep the engine you have to keep the revs up all that kind of stuff it makes it more difficult you don't have drag brake sometimes the engine keeps running so there's lots of like things changing also the car goes 100 grams lighter during a tank so that's a different as well um then he ran my e-buggy at one race and that went like a lot better he could put together a run and make no mistakes like that's in my opinion one of the easiest classes out there. Uh, e buggy or e truck is e truck is even easier, but e buggy is definitely one of the easiest. Then, then um, he ran one of my old tool drive cars on Astro, and that was something he could get around the track almost immediately. You know, um, and bear in mind he hasn't raced in like. Pretty much he'd never really raced. He just like sometimes went out and drove with my my cars. But I think he, unless you're running on really slippery surface with a tool drive buggy, the most difficult class is a uh, nitro buggy for sure. Because as, as soon as you have grip in 10 scale, it's actually quite easy. You just at least easy to go around the track. Obviously going fast in any class is difficult. Um, but I'd even say that it's hardest to go like a B, a very really good driver in eight scale nitro because it, you have to keep the corner speed up. You have to adjust to the things around you. And for sure, experience is the most valuable in nitro buggy. That's I had to adapt to. Say. Would, I, would I say this? I would say that 10 scale two wheel drive will make you a more cautious driver. Yeah. But I think that. Eight scale and and even Tasman said this. Like, he, if he had to practice one thing, it's eight scale nitro buggy. I think all because of all those reasons. Basically, um, I say this all the time. I see guys who run e buggy; they love it, at, but they struggle with nitro because they can't carry yeah. that corner speed and all that stuff. What they don't realize is that they they learn nitro, they'll be a better e buggy driver, you know, and yeah. a better truck driver yeah. and all that type of stuff. So I think. But I also understand that's not feasible. Like every, people want to go do e buggy, but yeah, I definitely think that nitro buggy is key to controlled chaos. You learn how to go fast outside. Yeah. The way you drive an eight scale nitro buggy is not the way you drive a two wheel drive mod car. It's it's yeah. different. Yeah. So you learn organized chaos. I would say an eight scale drive. You learn how to to bundle. You learn how to gr- take that. And just bond it all in and, and harness it and make it into what you do. That's yeah. and that's difficult in my opinion. But I gotta be honest though, I, I know this wasn't part of the question, but if you are looking out to be just a really, really good driver, I think like on road, like especially touring cars is the best class to be good at. Like Greg says it teaches you corner speed. I still think yeah. you still need to jump because I think. But the I still think that, really a, good, that a really good off-road driver can be go and be more competitive in on-road. Let's put it this way. I love Alexander Hackberg. He's my boy. I do not expect Alexander Hackberg to even think about being competitive in 10-scale night. Uh, yeah, but 10 scale like, two, it, 
I, I, I get different. your point. But if you think about who were the fast off-road guys who went and did really well in touring, like Ron and Falk is one who has done okay, yeah, but, but he yeah, hasn't he, won big races, you know. Mm-hmm. But if you think about um, like Ryan, yeah, but those guys done... focus on on that too. They they put a lot more focus on te- on touring car than what Ron Falk has. He's doing yeah, yeah. because he has a track. Yeah. I know, but it's it's like Coelho and uh, Naoto, um, Reinhard, Achusihara. All of these guys you. are touring car, car guys, you know, and. Uh, and then and I think when the conditions make... are right, they're just as competitive. The conditions have to be right for Bruno Coelho to be competitive. I don't 100%. think Bruno Coelho goes to DNC and is competitive against them guys to that extent. If it's at yeah. IBC, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? that, that that's. But I I think like if you are a good touring car driver, you have the tools to be a good eight scale off road driver as well. But if you are a good eight scale off road driver. You don't necessarily have the tools to be a great touring car driver. That's my point. <sighs> I debate you there. I debate you there. I debate you there. All right. I think we've beat that horse to death. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the. There were some good questions this week. Some really good questions mm, yeah. this week. We enjoyed them. Um, we're gonna go. on well, thank you to Beach RC for all the support. Remember, we have an affiliate link. Everybody, please use that. It helps us out. Um, and thank you to Brent and Lucas and everybody for their support. Check out Wheel and Trigger too. I think he's dropping a new. Uh, uh, new podcast as well, Max. I'm gonna go talk to Mr. President. He, he he actually unveiled some shocking news right off the bat. I'll talk about that afterwards, and um, yeah, I'll be back. We have some actually. What I'm gonna talk about actually coincides with that. So after we talk to Clayton, we'll come back. We do our conclusion. It's gonna be fast. We're not gonna be here long. So I'll see you after I talk to Clayton. Okay. Okay. All right, Maxi. You know, and that is brought to you by Techno RC. Thank you, Techno RC, for all the support. Congratulations to them. Uh, 2023 DNC Nitro Buggy Champions with Ryan Mayfield. Techno RC. Techno RC. Techno RC. Techno RC is a premium manufacturer specializing in eighth and tenth scale high performance off road RC buggies and trucks. Visit www.technorc.com for a complete catalog of their products. Techno RC, excellence in engineering. Hashtag Techno Takeover. Joining me this week in the NNRC virtual studio, if you guys uh, know who this gentleman is, you know who he is. This is the new president of the American Association or Federation that is Raw. Welcome, Mr. President. How are you? I'm doing good. A little the last time you was on her, you was uh uh you was still in the election, not even in the campaigning stages, I would say. That's what I would call it. You was campaigning to be raw president. Yep. And uh you have become raw president by a landslide, but I still think without some sort of shenanigans, but we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about your first few months as as the new raw president. Some of the things that you've been going through found harder to do. But uh, yeah, congratulations on becoming Raw President. I have to say that it seems to be, uh, you can see it on the Raw Facebook, on the way people are talking, the way people are now corresponding. People are getting like, they can they can smell or they can see the shift is coming. That There's a change going on in Raw right now. Yeah, I, I mean, there's been some negative comments, but a lot of people react to those positively mm-hmm. to like, step in and say, wait, the, I mean, everybody races five minutes. So what are you really complaining about? Like you're making a deal out of nothing because this is the way everybody's been doing it. We're just finally woken up and get on the same page. And yeah, I I've really appreciated the fact that um, in, in the old days, <laughs> a year ago, <laughs> when <laughs> Roar would do something or not do something, there would be just negative comments. And now uh, I don't know if if it's even 50-50. It's probably more like 70-30 positive versus negative. So well, really I'm pretty sure there's going to be a time where it's going to be 70-30 negative yeah. versus positive at some point. Because this yeah, is I mean, we're not going to get everything right. Like, right. It, it, anything happens. Like, even with the rule book, there's some stuff that we missed. And people are commenting in. I'm putting an update. I got another one coming out in the next day or two. Um, the Nitro on-road uh, qualifier length was seven minutes from whenever it was last updated and talking to the roar fuel section chairman Joaquin and 
um, Jose Almonte, another fuel racer, um, they need to be cut down to four. So we'll, we'll make the change and we'll push the update. That, and that's kind of what I did with the posting was like, look, it hasn't been updated in years. So there's probably going to be things wrong. Just let us know. Mm-hmm. We can run mm-hmm. it through committee, make sure everybody's on the same page and move things forward. It's about making this work great. Yeah, of course, of course. And it, it doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot to fix. <laughs> yes. There's a lot to fix. So we're going to talk about that. And that's good that you are reaching out to people in respective uh, p- respective genres to get the information. I know Jose as well. He's Dominican. He's, uh, ah. he's from here. He are from Santiago. Uh, he's he uh, he was a little bit upset too. He had a he had a few tank issue with Raw and GT in the uh, Nationals about two years ago. Yeah, same situation yeah, that happened. That. That, I wasn't uh, there, but I remember yeah. it. Mm-hmm. But uh, great dude, he's been he's been killing it. Uh, he's been racing a lot. Uh, okay, well let's talk about that. Uh, you did so you did win by a landslide. I think you got like a hundred and twenty something. Yeah, I think it was one hundred and twenty three to twenty five. So we're, we're just explain to maybe people out there that don't understand where do those votes come from? Well, <laughs> so it's it does, it's the administrator verifying the people that vote that are members. Mm-hmm. Um, but that process was very manual and probably can be done better because the website keeps track of memberships better than the handheld database keeps track of members. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would expect for the next vote, it would be much more accurate representation of what the votes were instead of it just being 150 votes. Okay. So you think there were more votes, just they didn't get registered probably because they didn't have memberships. Yes. Or they got to the point where they were, they were so far behind in saying who won that when it's 123 to 25, that's probably not going to get made up in yeah. the next hundred people or so. So I mean, they're just like, I, I kind of thought you was going to win this anyway. Um, I was just, nervous there for a little bit. Like I, I mean, was I was like, nervous why is because it taking so long. I know, I know. It took a very long time until a certain person made a post about it. I don't know who that was. <laughs> I was. I have no idea. Yeah, it might have been <laughs> somebody that's in this this stream right here. But it's as soon as I made, I made one post and I made another post, and then look, a guy messaged me and showed me the results. And said, "Here you go." Like before <laughs> they even posted them, and I was like, "Well done." Because well, at least I'm somebody's not, paying attention to you. Right. Right. <laughs> hey, but. I was I was scared. I thought they. I mean, we've heard how they've kind of railroaded some people before. You know, you we know that you also kind of you're coming in like you ain't taking no prisoners as you talked on the last time. So I, I'm sure there were a lot of people a little bit nervous about maybe how things were. So I was I was I thought they were going to take it from me. I thought they're going to railroad you. It could happen, but at least I tried. I, at least I could say I put good faith effort. Uh, I got myself out there went on podcasts like yours Mm -hmm. and like let people know where I was coming from and what I really want to get done. Yeah. And you still race because you're going to race in tomorrow and you, you, you just raced the the first nationals of your, your tenure, which we're going to talk about in a minute. I didn't get to race. I had to run the race. You didn't race. No, I was doing all the post race interviews and stuff. Oh, I was like running the event. So I was running the RMT management team. Okay. And live RC and getting stuff up to some kind of uh, quality standard that everybody should kind of expect. Which was very good, too. Uh, the quality of the stream was excellent. Uh, they had two people there, I think, this time, yep. which made a big difference. I told Brandon what I wanted, and he sent an next person. So it was good on him. Good on live RC. Well done, live RC. Well done. Uh, okay. Well, you get into power. You you get You get your vote. You get in there. What's your first day? I mean, did you? I don't get. I think you just have a virtual office. You don't actually have an office, but right. like, what's your first day in office with the committee? Like, I would say. So the first thing was a transition from the pre- previous president, where he um, turned things over, explained some things that were outstanding with Ifmar Worlds, and what the budget was, which was we were we had twenty one thousand dollars in the bank and forty thousand dollars in bills. So it was kind of unexpected to be upside down um, coming in Um, because I was in the committee before and there was still a significant chunk of change in the bank. But when I took over, there wasn't anymore. Was you surprised by that? I, yeah, I was a little, I I was definitely surprised. I didn't expect to owe more than we had. So what was the, did they give any uh, like reasons for it? Like that was acceptable? Um. Acceptable. They gave uh, 
what they could best figure out, which was the racing was costing 30,000 more a year than they were bringing in for racing. Okay. Um, which prompted the prompt firing of Jeff Parker from RMT because everything for the racing was running through Jeff Parker services. So to try and figure out what's going on there, you kind of have to clean, you'd have to start fresh and figure well, it you, out. You did say you was going to do that. Yeah. You did say you, if, if people weren't falling into place and they weren't doing their job, you, you was going to give them a chance. Yep. You was going to give them a chance. So you, you, you find a whole, you, you, you've let go of just for people to know, Jeff Parker is the interim president of IFMAR. Uh, he's also been involved in Roar for quite some time. He's always the guy on the RMT. He's, honestly, he's always the guy on his cell phone. But that's a story for another time. Uh, he also has, I heard, also heard that he, he took some of the equipment that Roar uses as well, right? So he, he didn't take it. He's just okay. not giving it all back because as RMT director, you're supposed to have the equipment so you can ship it from one place to another. Okay. And uh, we got a first ship in after a few weeks of haggling to get stuff back, which we thought was going to be everything. Um, but it turns out it was not close to everything. Mm. We're missing probably eight to ten thousand dollars worth of equipment still. Um, oh wow! From an AMB scoring uh, transponder box and PA system, radios, just lots and lots and lots of stuff. So um, he's stopped communicating with everybody. Um, so we're not sure what's going on. Uh, but we did ju did just do a vote of no confidence in the last meeting, so he is no longer a part of the committee in any way, shape, or form. So we are seeking lawyers to get involved, to send letters, to see if he'll give us our equipment back and go from there. Well, that's a shame. I hope he does give it back or explains why he doesn't have it. You know, I mean, I don't even really care about an explanation. I would just like to have right. the equipment back, so. We don't have to go buy stuff to do more nationals. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, I hope that gets all straightened out. Uh, and I hope that if Mar is watching as well, um, because if he, I mean, just respond, say, Hey, like I don't have it. or I do. Or I, I paid this much money for this. You need to give me this or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, poor sport. He was also one of the guys who was your biggest opposition. Uh, not him personally, but through proxies. Uh, yes. Trying to go against you. And, you know, I heard about all the different, you know, just trying to dethrone you just to de defame you and stuff like that and get people to not vote for you. So I guess I kind of understand why. Yeah. I mean, I was a Marine for 22 years, so you can keep coming at me. It doesn't matter. I'm like that bulldog. You just keep gnawing at your leg till we change. Like, <laughs> like it, I was told so many times, you can't do that. You can't do that. And I was like, where is it written? Well, it's just the way it is. Yeah, I don't work on just the way it is. Let's start writing stuff down. So it's not how we're supposed to do this. Oh, well, here's what you have to do. No, no, that doesn't even make sense. So write it down, document it. There shouldn't be anything that's left to somebody's opinion. <laughs> it should all be written down. And so we have a long way to go with all that because I'm still going through processes of reimbursements and stuff that like, what are we reimbursing people for when we do RMT? What what are we reimbursing for? Like I ran the RMT for this, the carpet nets. Um, and I basically bought lunch for everybody with the extra money that I made as running the team. So that way we didn't have to go try and pour for food or just eat junk food. I, well, we didn't get the best. Like I ordered pizzas and stuff, but mm -hmm. at least, you know, everybody didn't have to go find food. I even got stuff for the live RC crew. Cause as far as I'm concerned, they're part of the crew. Everybody's part of putting that event on. Mm -hmm. So everybody works as a team and we make everything better. I agree. Well, teamwork is dream work, right? Yeah. And teamwork I think, makes the dream work. <laughs> exactly. And I think just having somebody that probably has the balls to do things like what you did and mm -hmm. just come in and, and start, you know, looking under rocks and lifting up things and, and saying, Hey, what's looking under the rugs where they swept everything under and finding what's pretty much what people have felt all these years, you know, it's coming to fruition and, I, I would say that pretty much not, but that's also in a way it's a good thing because you're starting like fresh almost. Yeah. I mean, it takes a village. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Like I said, with the rule book, there's classes I've never even ran before. So I, I just look at what was in there with com committee. People had looked at what was in there and they did their best to keep things up to date, but you know, it takes the whole community to make the whole sport grow. It's not just, me or just the committee it's it's everybody out there even mm -hmm. podcasts like yourself like 
you guys feel probably more anger than than I see because when I see a bunch of um, negative stuff, I'm just like, okay, I'm not going to go down that road. I'll let other people say something. People message me. I don't mind personal messages. Like I can ignore rude comments just like everybody else. I just try and treat them with kindness. And if they turn around, they turn around. If they don't, they don't. One day I want Roar to be the place that everybody goes. That's how you do things. We're not there yet, but we're on our way. Yeah, uh, we. You, I think you were saying the mo- motto and all is we want you back, yes. or something like that. We so, w- we want you back. See you at the track. That's good. That's good. I like that. I like that one. It rhymes too. Jay Smoker <laughs> would approve of that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, what about regional directors and stuff like that? Have you got, have you started? Have you started getting any volunteers for that? I know they were missing some in some of the regions around America. So I haven't started reaching out, but I have had people started reaching out to me Mm -hmm. um, to ask what it would take to do a regional. Um, So, of course, that's not really documented either. (laughs) Um, So we are looking for region directors for all the vacant spots out there, Um, whether you're on road, off road. I mean, off road seems to have their stuff really together. So I would like to have some more off road um, participation from that, that side. Because for some reason people like jumping, so like <laughs> it's huge. I actually it's a like big it side the more it. I've the more I've done it, the more I'm like I see the fun in this, and okay, it's expensive as crap, but you know it is fun. So <laughs> it's very fun. It's a lot of fun. I I think it's the bigger side of Roar, really, to be truthful. I mean, I think the the eight scale nationals are almost sold out, or not, or um, or so they are sold out. um, But we have fifty more spots to allocate. I just needed to make sure that the pre qualified people are already in, and Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of counting on the administrator to do that. I'm not sure he's found time, so I'll probably end up running those to the ground first. Um, And then I know there's some people who want to race Truggy, uh, just. Just plan on that you're going to be a racing truggy because there will be 50 more spots open. Um, I just I just had to limit some stuff to make sure that the pros got in. Okay. And then I believe it's uh, the top 30 from last year. Or no, the, the, the two semis sep- from last year mm-hmm. and the A main truggy. They automatically get in. Yeah, yep. correct. All right, cool. I hope to go to that event. I've never been to Chico. It's, it's, a, it's a world year, so these years always get... Like people just I'm from Northern California, so it's almost like going home. Oh, okay. I've never been there before. Oh, uh, Chico is inland more. I'm more Mm -hmm. towards the coast. But if you can get around that area, like drive around a little bit, you'll be it's very picturesque. Is is the big sequoias nearby? Sequoias are down south, but the redwoods are up north. Redwoods. Okay. One of those big trees I want to (laughs) see. All right. Um, so I guess what was probably one of the hardest things for you to do when you took office that kind of you wasn't expecting besides the not having money and whatnot, what else was a little bit overwhelming for you at first? Um, uh, inspection process is a little overwhelming because it's kind of kludgy and it's outdated. Um, so we started switching some inspectors over we still have more to go. Um, the rules, I really felt like I had rules updated mm-hmm. and so I could just drop them. But then the more I realized we didn't have a GT 12 rule. So I needed to reach out to those guys. Um, I needed some people to help with the USGT VTA rules. I hadn't raced that in a few years, even though I kind of help everybody run those classes because that's where everybody grows up at. But um, mm-hmm. that, the rules took a lot longer than I thought just to have something somewhat decent to put out. Um, that was, that was disappointing on my part, but there were so many things going on that like, I I couldn't envision how you needed to start from the ground up on every single part of it. Um, uh, like, like literally starting from the beginning. Yeah. But you can't just, fire everybody and start from the beginning. No. So there's, there's no one person that has that much time on their hands. Mm -hmm. Um, But we did, you know, we have EA and Brent and Joaquin 
um, and Tim Caporell, the, all those guys are really responsive. We just, um, I'm getting ready to talk to tomorrow, our new technical director, Tim, I can't remember his last name cause we just did it. Um, but he's a retired professor, college professor, technical writer kind of guy. So that will be helpful cause I can pass these things on, um, the off-road guys who so are talking about the, I think it's stadium truck, um, no, truggy bodies. Is, well, truggy bodies, those are, uh, so we had a meeting with all the off-road guy, all, all the off-road manufacturers, and they said that the handling of the bruggy bodies is so much better that they would like to have a box so they don't get out of hand, but they don't want to go back to that open cab front that makes them do weird things. So it's not good anywhere, people. I I tell it everybody yeah. to just accept it. It's, it's here to stay. accept it and we'll at the fuel nets we'll get some measurements so that way we can keep them in a box and it won't get too crazy um it is racing so people are mm-hmm. always trying to develop stuff to make things handle better and get better and i understand the whole um not liking it because you want to have it look right but at the same time you don't want people having to jump and the car just lifts like a parachute so I mean, it ha- It was like that for many years. It worked, yeah. but <laughs> it was great. But I think they just realized that this is just uh, lighter, less, more aerodynamic, and just easier to draw. The only confusing thing is they look like buggies out there. They do. Yeah, they're just like they a do. bigger buggy. Yeah, but I just, I just don't think. I, like I said, I think the performance of them is too great for that. We're not going to see anybody go back to the original body. So, all my truggy fans out there, buggy. Bo- if you want to run the regular body, go ahead. That's what I say. That's what I say. Um, all right. Uh, membership. Uh, I know that's been another big issue for people. People haven't got their membership numbers. Uh, maybe I, I know you're going digital. Can you shed a little light on that, please? Yes. So the webmaster has been working feverishly the last three months on automatically sending your membership card um, to your email as soon as you register. And I think some people that uh, are doing the membership now can see in the old way, you had to refill out your name, every single part of it, your address. Now, when you log in, that stuff propagates for you. Um, I don't think that it's sending email notifications with member numbers. But in my eye, the member number really means nothing. What you just need to know is when your membership expires. Mm-hmm. Because uh, we, uh, the system has been tracking for the last couple of years, everybody's um, registrations and, and membership. It's just not where they can see it. So I've tasked the webmaster, if he can't get this done to where they can see it, you know, we're going to have to go a different direction. House of RC, uh, one of the things that you pointed out, I've talked with um, him last week, I think. I think it was last week um, about how that would work, um, what we could leverage as part of it and all that. So there are other options out there, um, but our webmaster has been, our webmaster for quite some time. So I'm giving him first, first option to, to get the ship righted um, and make it easy for everybody. Cause at the end of the day, we all have apps on our phone that take five seconds to do something. Mm-hmm. And our membership process is not one of those five second things. Right. Right. Uh, also, I think you said you was telling people if, if they just put zero, 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 zero. For yeah. You can put number. zeros, you can leave it blank. You, it doesn't matter. Cause when I go to verify your entries, it at the bottom of your entry, it tells me when you registered and tells okay. me when you expire. So it's super simple for me to verify. Okay. Okay. Simple. And I've sent everybody emails. Um, if they, if their membership isn't up to date and I think there's only one person that hasn't updated their stuff and I'll send him a reminder email. I know he's, a, he's an off-road guy, so he's okay. probably traveling from race to race to race and not really all checking right. email that much. No worries. No worries. Um, oh, great. Something else that I want to, I want to get all the bad stuff out of the way first, and then we can do some good stuff. Uh, I saw raw come up. I know this had nothing to do with you, but I think it's Valkyrie, Valkyrie, Valkyrie raceway. Uh, so they're not going to be yeah. Valkyrie. They're not going to be a raw member no more. Uh, I was kind of informed about the story about somebody was banned from the track and then they were at the race. And they, I don't know. I heard they flew a drone and they got banned and then that put them under the, the amount of people by raw standards where they get a bonus and that caused a whole bunch of kerfuffle. Yeah. So I wasn't part of raw at that point. I was at the race. I was racing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, 
from what I understand, the guy had been banned by the track owner. But when mm-hmm. Roar runs a race, there is no banning of people by the track owner. It's if you're part of if you're a Roar member, you're a Roar member, and you're in good standing, you can race. So that person took advantage of that, probably knowing it would instigate something. But that also gave the track owner his bonus because it was he was the one fiftieth or one seventy fifth entry, whatever it was, to get the bonus. Um, and so when he kicked him out, Roar had to refund his entry fee, which then takes him back down out of the the bonus money. I mean, for right. me, if I was a track owner and it was going to be whatever a thousand dollar bonus, fifteen hundred dollar bonus, I would have spent a hundred dollars to get fifteen hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. But I guess that didn't happen, or maybe they wouldn't let him. I, like I said, I wasn't part of Roar, so I don't know exactly how that all went down, and I can understand his frustration, mm-hmm. but I don't feel like saying war sucks is making anything better (laughs) it might get you two or three more entries at your track but you know at the end of the day one once everything is going great with roar the people that have thrown roar under the bus or been bad members they won't be able to renew because we can't count on them to not do something crazy right understandable it's unfortunate too because I knew you had nothing to do with that. I know you was racing that race. Uh, and I, it's just like kind of comes out at a time and I know people are trying to ch- do change things. Right. And uh, honestly, like, I'm not going to lie. Everything is under a microscope for you guys. Oh right yeah. yeah. So yeah, I get it. You know, everything you do is going to be amplified. Your response. I think like you do, the best thing you do is just be, um, I, I had the word to clear clever. Oh, my God, what is it? Uh, what's the word, man? Come on. When you're uh, open and you everybody can see transparent you, transparency, that's it. Why couldn't I think of that word? I don't know. You said clairvoyant. I was like clairvoyant. What yeah, I, was, you, you know, that's you me. What are the words? <laughs> yeah, but more transparency because we had none, none yeah. before. Yeah. And um, you know, you doing things like this, responding on Facebook, stuff like that, being more active on Facebook, it means a lot. And I, it, people are seeing the shift, but. Like I said, everything is going to be just under a microscope. So things you're, you're going to get blamed for stuff that you had nothing to do with you. Yeah. You know, and that's it why happens. I kind of wanted to bring up that, that incident. Cause when I saw that, I was like, that's not good. Like, what <laughs> right. is it like, you know? And then it was explained to me what happened. So yeah, good stuff. All right, let's switch it over and let's go through some positive stuff. So you had your, you, so now you don't have an RMT. Are you, are you going to be looking for a new RMT? You Tim Caparell is the new RMT director. He just got promoted at work, so he wasn't able to go to that race. Okay. So we both decided the best way is have the president be there, have the president run it. It's people that I run with every weekend. So it was a um, a friendly crowd-ish, mm-hmm. if there is a friendly crowd in RC. <laughs> um, but your peers, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I made some people mad. I called a lot of penalties. Um, some people thought I should have called more. I tried to explain to him when you're in a line of 10 cars at the beginning of a race and somewhere in the middle, people get together. It's not going to be clear on what happened. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to penalize somebody if I didn't right out, see them wreck you. Not only that, but the, uh, I think what a lot of people fail to realize with a referee is his job is not, not to just penalize guys, but it's also to keep the racing going at a, at a rate where you can still race but not be afraid, you know, not be too scared. Like, you know, you yeah. have enough respect for that person. You got to go for it at some point. And I think that's, that's what a real referee is really good at. Like not just calling every penalty. Yes. You got to call penalties, but also making the racing as fair as possible for everybody and understanding when some circumstances are different. Um, yeah. It was we had help- some, I mean, we had some where, you know, maybe third place spun second place, mm-hmm. but they instantly waited or, they wrecked themselves trying to not wreck the person. So mm-hmm. nobody got an advantage. It right. sucks as a person who gets wrecked, but you know, like, I'm not going to repenalize them after they already stopped and did what they're supposed to, because I made it clear there. Like if you get into somebody, if your front wheel's not in front of their rear wheel, then you don't have right for that corner. And okay. if you throw it in there and you wreck them, then you either stop and wait, or I'm going to call you to stop and wait. And if you don't stop, I'm going to penalize you a lot. Like it's not going to get better by not listening. And oh, for the most did part, did you have to penalize somebody a lap? Um, I did. They must <laughs> and, have not been happy. Yeah, uh, no. Well, part of it was my fault because I couldn't see his car number. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a VTA race, and I was calling his car colors, 
Um, and he had ju- so he wrecked the leader. So there was a big kerbuffle at the beginning of the race. He thought he heard people in the crowd saying, do a restart, do a restart. So he let up and the guy got around him. And then four uh, turns later, he just like just took him out. Yeah, he just he just pit maneuvered him hard. <laughs> and so I instantly was like, all right, red and black, that's stop and go. And he went around. And then I'm like, it's not going to get any better if you don't stop and go. Stop and go this time. He went around again. So I'm like, last chance. He went around again. I'm like, all right, there's a lap. And then at, at that around that point, the um the announcer figured out who is what his name was. So he he had heard his name or tied the two things together. And then him and like he he came up to me about five times after the race, um, say, you know, saying his side of the story, which I understood. Um, but at the same time, I kept explaining, like, if you're you're getting into the lead by going through somebody and it's like instantly called, you shouldn't have any question that it was you like mm-hmm. that should just be. Oh, I'm a red and black car, and I just wrecked the guy getting back to the lead. You, you, you kind of should know that, right? <laughs> but also, it's important to have numbers. It is. We did have numbers. Um, some of the ones that we had printed were smaller; mm-hmm. they were too narrow, mm-hmm. so I couldn't read them. So uh, that's no, on, on me. I didn't realize how important numbers were until I started commentating on races. Like it's it's the one thing you look for. And, you know, you, you just, you hope you're right because you can't get everybody's body right. Right. Well, and I think we need to, one of the ideas was go to different colored numbers. Mm-hmm. So whether you can read the number that it is or not, you'll still know what number it is by the color. So we just mm-hmm. come up with some standard colored scheme and that way it makes it easier for everybody. Right. Like number 10 is green. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's, that makes sense as well. That makes sense. Uh, so your new RMT, Tim. Yeah, is he from? Is he an on-road uh, gentleman? He's on-road and off-road. Okay. Uh, he races carpet off-road, I think. I, okay, I know he races a little bit of everything, um, but he's he's run snowbirds for probably 10, 15 years. So, mm-hmm. um, and other races, he runs the NYGP sometimes. Like uh, calls it like race. Right, right. I got it. you. I got you. Um, How many people do you send with an RMT team? How many is it that usually go to a race? Like, let's say he's going to the Nationals in Chico. Who would go? So that one, because it's got 300 entries, will be at least for probably five people. Mm-hmm. Um, because you're going to need at least two people in tech. You're going to need somebody on the driver's stand calling penalties, if not two people. And you got to have somebody doing race directing. So, mm-hmm. okay. Um, it's kind of varies by the number of entries because the carpet on road, we were only going to do three because we typically get 140 entries, but this year we had 230 entries. So we ended up I sending four um, and live RC sent it a couple of people. So it all kind of worked out. Yeah, it did uh, that just for people to know that took place at apex RC raceway in Tennessee. I don't sponsored know exactly. By Cry Baby racing sponsored <laughs> by cry baby racing. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I did not follow this, but I was able to follow it because there were regular social media posts. So kudos to you guys. So I knew who was in TQ and all that stuff. Uh, like I said, the coverage was great. You know, live RC stepped it up and a lot of people noticed it. Like a lot of people commentated and also getting 230 entries is good. Helps you guys out, uh, helps to track out everything. So that was good to see. Uh, so I think for your first event, you guys definitely, uh, did some positive things like just being up to date on social media, letting people know TQs, stuff like that was great. You had, uh, like you said, live RC there. You had Randy Caster from one up. I believe he was doing the pictures Yes, yep. as well. So it was really good. Like this is probably one of the, one of the on road carpet nationals that I actually followed. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, there was another big race going on that weekend. I think you were kind of sidetracked with that one. I was definitely sidetracked, <laughs> but I, I kind of saw this. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. Off-road is always going to take adva- uh, gonna, gonna, gonna take over, like, and especially that type of race, which we're going to talk about because I think you guys can do it. But I, I did notice it. Uh, we, I even messaged you and said, you know, good job with everything that, that you guys done. But it's going to get better. It's going to polish it up a little bit more, yep. you know, and get going but definitely some positive steps forward like that uh i hear you're gonna do a live maybe soon as well on raw as well so the answers to people's questions i know you're gonna have a lot of questions oh, yeah. so uh yeah bring them all i don't care if they're bad or not bring them all 
that's good because I think I think we've been for so many years with everything being swept under the carpet. I mean, even I think like we don't we haven't had no financials since what 2016. Well, we know yeah. why we haven't had no financials yeah. since 2016. But yeah, I'm gonna I I'm, I think we have some emails floating around somewhere where we can try and catch that up to date. I don't know if it'll be as detailed, but at least mm-hmm. it'll be out there. Okay. <clears throat> But well, that's good. Will you now be attending all these races this year, all the nationals this year, to race or just to be there as the president? Or, or yeah, what? my plan is to be either be racing, like I'll be racing the Florida carpet race. Okay, and I believe I'll be racing the on road paved race. So the Florida carpet off road and the on road paved. Um, I probably won't race the field race because I was pretty miserable at that the first time I tried. So I might just show up for like the weekend. I got to see right. how we are with coverage for the RMT team and stuff. But I don't want to, like, if I do it, I'll pay for it myself because I don't want it coming out of Roar's funds just to have the president there. That doesn't make sense to me. So Right, right. Well, I mean, just having you there, because I've been to two nationals and I've, I had yet to see the Roar president mm. there. I, in fact, I thought Jeff Parker was the Roar president. So... <laughs> Not, no, you might have thought he was the world president. You never know. <laughs> maybe at that point he was the world president, but um, or proxy world president. But that's great. I think uh, another little get going out and enjoying the racing. So you get to you get to you know what you get to complain to your own team as a racer. That's what you get to do. You guys messed up her. I know I'm a racer, but I think it's great to have a, a racing president. You know, and also it keeps your passion alive for what you're doing because you're going to need it. Well, yeah, I feel like if you're not racing, then you probably shouldn't be on the committee. Like, okay. you need to be in touch with what's going on. Otherwise, you're not benefiting. Like, you're not benefiting the sport. I mean, so Tim probably doesn't race as much as I do. But if he's not racing, he's running races. So he's mm-hmm. still intimately involved in drivers' complaints about this or that or how things could be different or better. Or Like, like not everybody's idea is going to be the best. Sorry, mm-hmm. it's just not going to be. Um, so uh, yeah, you can't do everybody's idea e- either. No, they contradict each other for the most part. Like, yeah. I one guy everybody wants a 15 wants minute race. Done. The other one wants a five minute race. And you're like, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> you know, but, and I know th- the issue is that everybody wants their ideas heard at, or implicate, implicate, implemented, but it, it's just not possible at all. Well, right. And especially the, so like the five minute thing came from manufacturers at the carpet race because we had 230 entries. And you're trying to get all those qualifiers done. You take the one minute off the qualifier. Besides, it's what everybody does at the big races for carpet on road now. Um, Like you take that one minute and it shortens your your show by 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So or around by 45 minutes. And in on road, which I don't understand why off road isn't the same, but um, they're all about the open practice, you know, getting on the track more, more, more track time. The off-road events I've been to, it's very limited. Like you, you practice with your heat, and then you're done. And I'm like, wait, I'm still trying to learn how to get through the air, let alone turn. <laughs> I know, but to be fair, most most off-road races are like that. Yeah, but uh, I think it's just about being fair at the end of the day. So everybody has the same amount of track time as well. Yeah, I, and I get that. It kind of saves you from yourself. So in an on-road race. We'll sit there and practice till midnight, one o'clock in the morning. But an off-road race, you know, you're done. There's if there's a practice after the race, it would be abnormal. Most of the time, the practices are in the morning before, and then when you're done with racing, tracks close. So, well, 230 entries would be a lot for you guys in on-road. I think. What what time was you getting out of there nights without shaving off any time? Nine thirty. I think we were pretty much done with the last race. Oh, you guys, you guys have got it easy. <laughs> you got it. You got it easy. Yeah, we're you not fuel. You don't have to warm up and then refuel and then start. Yeah, try being at the track to twelve one. Yeah, and when, being there tomorrow. My in the first uh, roar experience was uh, off road fuel in Texas. I ended up having to do call the races because our our race director didn't show up or called out like the day before we got there. So my experience was in a box in a corner. I couldn't even see the whole track trying to call lap times for everybody and getting yelled at by people like Adam Drake because somebody who was in his way. And I'm, I don't even know who he is. I mean, I figured out who he was later. I'm like, who is this guy yelling at me? Like, I can't even see the half of the track. 
<laughs> but, was this at Thorn? Was this at the covered Thornhill, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So probably what 2019, 2016? twenty yeah twenty nineteen yeah it had to be twenty nineteen right. yeah yeah I mean oh. I got a lot of positive comments like oh man you're sound you sound like I'm watching it on TV it's super cool and then I ended up running out of voice before the main like I got through the semis and then I was done I had no more voice so we had a one of the other guys that was local ended up calling the main I was like oh man you gotta be kidding me four days and I can't even do the last hour <laughs> hey those those that's a lot of talking. Yeah, and I was really emotional. Like Spencer Rifkin said, yeah, I could tell by the way you were getting all hyped up that you weren't going to make it till the last day. <laughs> <laughs> That's what uh, I was always taught. Don't go full out. Don't go full bore all the way. You know, it's, it's a gradual increase as you go on. Uh, that's what Nick Damon ta- taught me. All right, let's talk uh, Carpet Nets. That's next up on the on the list for you guys. That's next month. Yes. Uh, it, it's at Beach Line. Enters a little bit low right now. Um, um yeah i just approved i think another 10 or 12 today okay so it's starting to pick up i think i don't think you're gonna get as big as entries as maybe last year but you will get them um what i what i was thinking you know and i, and I said this to you obviously so during the onward nationals that were happening for you they had the mkgp going on which was over in the uk and they were doing that in front of in a mall okay and the BRCA was heavily involved. They had their media team. You know, they had everything set up for uh, like a, a test track for people to try. You know, explaining to people how RC worked. That because apparently there was a lot of foot traffic. Imagine it's in a busy mall in England. You got Scotty out there, like one American guy bellowing and out times. Like I'm sure you could hear him through the whole mall. Like they got a lot of attention. Uh, do you think that this is something we can see? Raw do for the carpet now because I think it, it it's carpet so it has to be ten scale carpet we have to have some jumps we do it I know some people do it for on road too we have to have some jumps because jumps people like jumps is this something that we can see raw working towards to have a nationals in a mall or similar or something similar to this um I I would like to have big events televised mm-hmm. um so ultimately yes. Okay. Uh, if it's not a mall, maybe a grand ballroom kind of thing, mm-hmm. like they do at Snowbirds or whatever, somewhere a large venue. Um, mm-hmm. Because I feel like the more you interact with normal people, not just the RC community, the more p- interest you're going to get and the more eyes you get. And it's not just about doing the same things we've done for the last 50 years. Like, mm-hmm. um, I, I feel like the sports got to grow by leaps and bounds and it feels like it's on the verge of being able to do that. Mm -hmm. We get a product that's marketable that people were entertained watching. I I literally had at least two people say their wives stayed and watched the broadcast for carpet on road. And that, that that was like, wow. Well, if there was two that actually said that it happened, there was probably more because Mm -hmm. they were able to see post race interviews. They could see the driver's pictures popping up as they were leading or battling like it, it it has to be that entertainment value for not just the RC racer but for everybody like we need to get to a spot in the sport where we don't pay money to go race we get paid money to go race mm-hmm. that would be that that would be the ultimate goal is that all these silly things like table tennis soccer with your foot like uh, that are soccer's on, awesome it, now soccer is so- awesome. no soccer is cool it's table tennis soccer oh, so they're playing they have like this extended ping pong table that's on the ground and they're kicking the ball back and forth. Like they're playing ping pong with a soccer ball. Like it's no just way. some another made up sport that's on ESPN. <laughs> I'm like, wow, we have way more entertainment value than this. <laughs> we can't get on the Ocho, man. We just want to get on ESPN Ocho. That's it. We, we don't seem, uh, we do, we do, we do need a product though. And um, I think we need to be, we need to encourage charisma. We need to encourage, um also explaining this to people it's yes. all good to have a it's all good to have a race at, in a mall with thousands of people watching if they don't understand what's going on so it's yeah. it's a collective effort like it, to do stuff like that you have to have people there just to explain and just to draw people in and stuff like that or even on the on the broadcast uh actually so visions the risen race which the, which live rc done they yeah. actually bought that guy Garrison, yep. No, like they brought Garrison. Garrison in as a as the RC guy, right? Uh huh. But then they had a non RC guy who I, I can't remember his name. Is a famous? Oh, um, 
He works I don't for remember Mac what TV. his name is, but you're talking about the, the announcer. Right. So he knew yeah. nothing about RC. He was able to take that with what Garrison was telling him. And then he, I thought he was able to explain RC on a term where we might be like, oh, that's simple. You know, because we're RC that's nerds. What the viewers, yeah, but that's what the but, viewers need. Exactly. I think that's one of the biggest things that we, we don't, people don't know what we do. Then when they see it, they don't understand it. So yeah. we need I, to. I thought about stuff like that while I was doing that, but trying to run the RMT and be the post race interview guy. Like, mm-hmm. I just, I had no more bandwidth to make stuff up from my head. Like, I was struggling just to remember everybody's names and stuff. No, it takes so. a team. It takes a yeah. team. And each person has to be do the individual things. But I think this is where we have to be thinking. Yeah. You like, you, we had morning part of the broadcast where we could have had a touring car and said, you know, for all of you watching live on Live RC, here is a touring car. These are the cars that are going down the straightaway at 65 miles an hour, eight foot lanes, you know, and they're controlling them with a handheld radio, show them the radio. Cause most people don't even get to see what they're controlling them with. Mm-hmm. Like break it down. Like mm-hmm. just I agree. get a little I more agree. personal. I agree. I think that's, I think that's one of the things I like to see raw is like start a campaign to, to bring RC to people in a, in a way, or make it more simple for people to understand you know, uh, and definitely make it exciting for, for the average person to watch. So, but Hey, that's, it's a lot of things to do. Uh, got to knock down, you got to knock down what you can and then work and keep stuff like that for the future and work towards it. I would say. Yeah, um, we, uh, we definitely have lots of ways to improve. Um, so like nothing's off the table, even changing the way we qualify, maybe, you know, mm-hmm. go to some kind of Saturday night feature kind of thing where, you take the top drivers, you spread them out across the heats. They got to win their race to mm. get into the main. So, mm. like, it's more racing than qualifying mm. for five days. And mm. here's your main, and see you later. Like, some heads up qualifying, like even different types of qualifying, maybe. Yeah. Some, some like in. I mean, you still have your poll where mm-hmm. they, you know, fastest lap you go gets you something, or fast three laps gets you something. But then everybody else, like, so they're guaranteed in. Um, but everybody else kind of races their way in. Make it make it entertaining, something for people to watch instead of just a few days of qualifying and then triple A mains and we're done. I know we, we us RC nerds love it. Though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, I'm a driver. I, I like having multiple chances to get you know farther up in the show. So, mm-hmm. um, like I get it, but mm-hmm. at the same time, we need to figure out how to get it and make it more racing than than your own clock. Like people don't mm-hmm. watch a marathon to see what time the person in 100th is running because they're on their own clock. They watch a marathon to watch the front runners win. You know, this is a big topic in the offer community. A lot of people are talking about this now. They would rather, you know, racing, heads up racing for qualifying. Lots, a lot of race directors and formats are are scheduling. I know RCGP, they did all heads up racing as well for the pro side, the RCGP side. The mm. RC2 had a, uh, had, I think they did three, two regular qualifiers. Then they had a qualifying race, and you know, so I I can't remember. So there's many ways you can do it. I like Super Bowl too. We did Super Bowl. I think yeah, that's cool. I saw that at the Worlds um, yeah. for Nitro, and I was like, that is kind of cool. Those six guys get to go out there and see who can run the fastest lap. That's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so I did have a question that I wanted to ask. Uh, is there a plan or in place to bring back regional events to qualify for national events? I know this is extremely, I know you mentioned it earlier. We, we, there's no rules around a regional race or something like that. You said yet. Yeah. So I would love to have regional events qualify you for nationals mm-hmm. or at least the championship cup for nationals. Cause right now I feel like we make so many classes just to win trophies. We're diluting the sport instead mm-hmm. of race against the best. Well, I just want to race against the, people that i feel like i can beat mm-hmm. and that's not making you any better uh, no. i've been there I, and i understand the mindset but if we want to grow as a sport and get better we need people running the championship classes instead of making more classes uh that are slower um so how would but uh, how would the, i think the biggest thing with regional races is getting people to attend them as well uh, yeah. There's so many other races going on, big, every, you know, all these other big races going on. 
it's it's hard to co- to get somebody and not only that like you said it's hard for somebody to commit to let's take eight scale nitro buggy for for let's take mm-hmm. eight scale like we're gonna have eight scale you're just gonna run one eight scale no clap like no sportsman no intermediate and you're gonna run truggy that's it it's hard to sell a track on that yeah and it's hard to sell it's hard to sell the average person that maybe in that region will come to that race does that make sense yeah yeah yeah, because totally they're so does. used to they're so used to having that, you know. Oh, I can run e buggy and you know whatever else they want to run. They can run five classes if they want. How can we make that more attractive for people to? Because I think that the region should be run in the way that the races are run. Yeah, so I feel like for regionals, kind of like if we want to do a championship series, which Off Road Nitro definitely wants to do. There's even talk about. Uh, national champion across dirt carpet nitro. Um, but that's like a bigger discussion. But I mm-hmm. think for regionals, you say, okay, these are your championship classes that will qualify you for Nats. Mm-hmm. Then you still have your sportsmen and like like we do for the exhibition at Nats. You have those classes that keep the, you know, your entry counts, the people that don't want to run for a national title. They want to race, you know, like talent or younger or older or whatever, however they want to break the classes down. So you just designate the classes that would, you know, qualify for nationals at your regional. Mm -hmm. And then those people, we should have some system where we can verify how they finished in the region to qualify for nationals. Um, We've got a ways to go to get there. First, we got to have region directors that can put on the events. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like we got to walk before we crawl. Um, But ideally, you could even have a state race that qualified you for a regional race that qualified you for nationals. Mm. I don't think, I think they've always had state regional and nationals, but I don't think they ever qualified Mm -hmm. for one or the other. You just went to whatever race you wanted to go to. Yeah. I think somebody could just call a race, a state race too. Yeah. And it would, it would be good. How about maybe piggybacking off some of these races, like making it a raw official race. uh, Maybe some of these smaller races in the regional, instead of trying to fight, and have a race in that region. Like, okay, we're going to send a small RMT guy or one or two guys there to help you out. And we'll piggyback and we'll just make this official Royal Regionals. Yes. So we're actually, I'm, I'm talking to Myron Kennard right now. Um, and we've talked a few times. So that, that concept, they have Southern Nationals right now where it's a big VTA USGT race. Mm-hmm. And because their exhibition at our nationals, that would then become their nationals. So Roar would piggyback on to that race that already exists. It's always, I think it's the second or third weekend in September. Um, it, like it's always, the carpet guys always know it's like a first carpet race of the year, big carpet race. Um, so we would piggyback on that where we wouldn't bring the whole team, RMT team. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe send one of the RMT members that's close to make sure techs run, but the track collects the money. The track, mm-hmm. you know, runs the race. We just verify that, you know, people maybe are, have a member push there. Yeah. So, I mean, they would need to be members. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of them already are because they registered for nationals. So mm-hmm. the, a lot of the same crowd and on road kind of travels around the country mm-hmm. together. Um, but yeah, a membership push, but also at the same time as a membership push, um, explaining why it's important to be members. Um, I think Danny was bringing up something the other day where the tracks are told that they have to have a sanctioning number to make sure that the war insurance covers them. And we can fix that really simple. If you're a track and you're a war track, your sanction number is the day of that event. Now all your events are covered. Mm, okay okay how about um are we seeing more tracks appeal like for instance i know that you guys have some in the off-road scene i don't know about in the on-road scene but i know in off-road they were having some issues with getting tracks to do these races Uh, yeah in the on-road scene we're definitely we don't have a nitro fuel track for nationals this year so okay uh, there were i guess there were a few people that said they might be interested if we renegotiated the, our current contract, which I'm all for the mm-hmm. you know, other ways to do races. So mm-hmm. we're not stuck into any contract, but it, it can't be where, you know, war is losing $10,000 on a race 
And I, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't want that anyways. But like, we right. I think everybody has to make the money. It. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Working Absolutely. with people to make their money. Yep. I hope it, I, I, I've seen what I know, what, what, how it works, like how, how much you have to get and all that type of stuff to make money off it. But I think, uh, part of going forward and doing things differently is also listening to those people and, and trying to figure right. out a way to work with them because you need the tracks, you know, you need the tracks to do Absolutely. these events. We need everybody. We need mm-hmm. tracks. We need drivers. We need manufacturers. We can't, we can't do squat without everybody. Like yeah, I the agree. whole mindset of we are roar and like we know best, you know, that that's gone. Like mm-hmm. bring all your information. I, like I said, I can't agree, say I'll agree with you. But if we're not having the discussion, then nothing's changing because nobody's talking. Right. So you got to have the discussions, good or bad. You know, some things we screw the pooch on, and we just got to do better. Like I'm, yeah. I'm fine with that. Like that was wrong. We'll do better. Yeah, I don't think so. Another hot topic I saw of coming off the Valkyrie incident was the increase of the membership. It went from what thirty five to forty now. I think. Yeah, they they did that right before I came to office. Um, mm-hmm. Pretty much the. Roar has been losing money for quite some time. So the, the $5 increase was to not be losing so much money, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they increased the track uh, membership as well. Because um, insurance for the tracks is a pretty hefty chunk of chain okay. change um, a year. So that we had to at least try and get some of that money back. Yeah, that's understandable. If people need insurance, they pay for it with... Uh... You know, that all inflation it goes up, all that type of stuff. That's $5 or more. It's been $35 for as long as I can remember. I think it was 30 yeah. when I started. So, you and know. it's still cheaper than a set of tires for off road. It is. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 you know, we're, we are talking about racers. And, <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, I get it. So we know how we know how racers are. We're our worst enemy. We will spend thousands of dollars and everything matching, but we ain't going to spend that $5. <laughs> but, you know, we ain't going to spend that $5. So we, we are our worst enemy. Um, yeah, man, I, I look forward to, I look forward, any other things you want to discuss or you have any pipeline, any ideas, uh, for Rogan in the future? Maybe, um, one thing I'm big on is youth. Is there anything to get more, to put in, and then what, excuse me, put any more focus on the young racers? I know it's hard to get young racers into this. Yeah, but I think part, you touched part of it, which is explaining the sport, mm-hmm. like whether it's through broadcasts or people there live at the track. Mm-hmm. like when I'm racing locally, if there's a family that comes in, I try and get FaceTime with them uh, and explain a little bit of, you know, how you can get in, get into the sport with a ready to run, you know, Traxxas just because mm-hmm. we have a Traxxas slash track or class at our mm-hmm. track. Um, so you can get into that. And then if it's something you really want to do, then you can buy somebody's used vehicle and learn how to work on it. Or, you know, if you want to buy a new vehicle, buy a new vehicle, but you don't have to drop two grand to get the latest and greatest buggy and motors and batteries. When you're and you don't have to, to run three sport. or four classes right away either. You should stick yes. to one class and run and learn that. I think that's a, a big mistake by a lot of new people. They get, Oh, I want to run everything. So well, that, and, or they'll get a slash and it doesn't handle very good. And, you're trying to drive a vehicle that doesn't handle mm-hmm. and you're learning how to drive at the same time. That's not usually super helpful. Yeah. But it's a great, it's a great gateway. I think the, this, there's a lot of tracks that have spec slash. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's a great way for people to get in to see if they're going to like this. I don't, I don't think, I don't think there's, I think we should be exploring every way to get new people into RC. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm a thousand percent behind that. You know, I, don't I think, think we also need way. to get the oval people back into the community. Like there is even around Huge. me, there's probably five, six oval tracks. I love go racing some dirt oval. It's yeah. it's fun. It's like you get to slide around, throw it in the corner. Like it's just so do they don't, they don't have any raw affiliation with the dirt oval crowd. No, oval took um, left roar uh, quite a few years ago because okay. I wasn't around. But I think they were. They felt like they were paying membership and they weren't getting anything, any value for their dollar. So mm-hmm. they just said, okay, we're going to make our own rules, do our own thing, and you won't have to pay membership fees or whatever. Um, but I feel like uh, it would be great to get them back mm-hmm. and you know, put on events like we did for the World Carpet Nationals 
on an oval track, have your post race interviews, have driver mm-hmm. pictures come up, like, like interact with the people. Don't make it. So don't talk to us. We're roar. <laughs> like, the no, are talk to us, man. have fun. Let's, yeah. let's, we're here to race each other, not to, to get pissed off and, and scream and yell and throw things like let's, let's do this and have fun. People are important. People are important. We need more people, period. It's, yes. it's what makes our sport, our hobby slash sport great. Be- meeting people from all around the world. And, you know, I always tell people, like, we need people say, we build tracks, they will come. Or, you know, this, we enter is this way and this way. I said, it means nothing without people. You need people to have entries. You need have people to have tracks as well. You need yeah. people to, to race. So I think uh, yeah, just collectively as an industry, we need to put some thought to that and move forward with that. Anything we can do, anything we can do, we should explore to get new people in. We shouldn't be laughing at any ideas, I think. No, I mean, and if you're having a race in one of our regions, um, you don't, and you're not a war track, let us know. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's about promoting the sport. Sure, we'd love you to be a war track or, you know, hold a war race. But until we get to the point where the sport's so big, like, we need to promote every thing everywhere and i have no problem throwing it up on our facebook page or website you're gonna have to go race some dirt oval now that's what you're gonna have to go do (laughs) i liked racing dirt oval it was fun yeah i'm pretty sure you can find some dirt oval racing near you i'm pretty sure you can cool um i think that's all i had we're gonna i think we're gonna this is probably one of your first appearances as the world president i think our plan is to have you come on every few months to Give us a little update of what's going on in Roar, which is really great. Lots of transparency. Um, wh- good luck at the Carpet Nationals. Remember, everybody, that's happening next month. You guys want to sign up for that? That's a great facility. Yeah, let's fund Keenan and get him out there. I don't think I'm going to make it this year. I think... Uh, I think um, You're a draw. Um, you need to make it. One day. I would... Uh, the, the the Fuel Nationals. That's my... my, my you know, It's that's not a- all about the Fuel I know. I do. I look. I thoroughly enjoyed the carpet nationals. Um, the carpet championships. Oh, I the think. state, Florida state. Um, no, the one that I met you at the Florida, um, Car- Florida carpet champs. Yeah, like I, I think, I think that carpet racing is, is the future for RC because I see how they do it in the UK with semi semi permanent tracks, mm. you know, and stuff like that. I think we can get more, more tracks out there with more people racing club race. I, I've seen a cl- uh, like that same. That same club that put on the MKGP, I used to go to race Tuesday night club racing with them. And they had a, basically they had a hall in a, a university that they rented out. They rolled out the actual turf, built a driver stand, put all the jumps on, laid down hers, and you had a track in like an hour. Huh. And you, they pulled it all on at the end of the day. So I think that's a, a semi-permanent, it's really big in the UK and Europe because of space, right? So they can't yeah. have permanent tracks, so they have semi-permanent I think it's key to get a new people in. Carpet's fairly easy. It's got traction. You know, you ain't got to worry. That's one thing you got to worry about. Yes, you and you get up to higher echelons. It's It doesn't have the traction that you want. But when you're just beginning, slap those spikes on, go out there and turn laps. Right. And you could do it anywhere. I really think it's the future. All right, Clayton. Um, well, hopefully I will see you this year at some one of these races. I hope to make it to a Nationals of some sort this year. I'm sure uh, I'll find you. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Uh, I know it's very time consuming, and you do have a, a life outside of this, like a real job. Yeah. So, uh, and to all the people, because all of Raw is volunteer, volunteer, I believe. So it's it's everybody but the administrator. An administrator makes thirty thousand a year. There we go. See more transparency. See he's not like rolling any dough. People thirty thousand a year. You know, but uh, that's the administrator. Nobody right. like I don't get paid. Yeah, I know you don't get paid. I know you don't get paid. And then I know that you probably you have, you like your WhatsApp's going, your messenger's going. I, I can imagine what's going. Yeah, my phone's been going up, blowing oh, up. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I hope people get some answers. Um, Thank you for your time. Thank you for doing this because a thankless job. And uh, I want to say congratulations on your first race. It was good. Lots of positive things. Let's keep going forward. Absolutely. And thank you for hosting. Like it, without podcasts, the information isn't getting out there. So oh, I appreciate I it. So. I hope so. If anybody wants to get in contact with you, what is the best way to do it? Um, president at Roar Racing is the email or mm-hmm. Clayton Young on Facebook Messenger mm-hmm. or whatever. 
He will get back to you, people. Let's imagine that he has a lot of people messaging him right now. I can imagine that. <laughs> It'll probably be surprisingly fast, uh, yes. would be my guess. All right. Well, cool. Um, thank you for your time, and we'll talk later. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. That was a great chat with uh, the new world president, Clayton Young. Uh, amazing what he found on getting into office and what he had to start with. He basically said, I didn't realize like we was really, really starting from the beginning. Uh, he's having some issues with getting some of the RMT back from Jeff Parker, who's the interim president of of IFMAR, I want to say. So it's uh it's it's yeah, it's a lot of things going on. Like the guy doesn't want to give the equipment back and they're trying to go forward. Uh but yeah, remember that everybody, we for Raw to be great and to be good again, we need you all involved. So if you're looking to be a regional director or whatever, get in contact with Clayton. We need more people involved in Raw. Max, we're gonna go into a conclusion. But uh, we got a big race coming up. The first big race, well, second big race in Europe, uh, the International Buggy Challenge 2023. This is the fifth uh, edition of this race. They'll have two classes, Nitro Buggy and Eco. It is a cap race, sorry, uh, E-Buggy. So it's 135 entries for Nitro Buggy, 45 entries for E-Buggy. Uh, this race will take place on the 12th of, from the 12th of May to the 14th of May in the beautiful uh, Barcelos, Portugal, I hope to be there. Do you guys think I should go? I hope I go. I think I might go. But with that said, uh, it'd be good. I think uh, I really enjoy this race. I look forward to seeing what they're going to do. Uh, if you guys don't know anything about the uh, Barcelona track, here it is from the Euros. Check it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, here's the uh, commercial. Thank you to IBC. Uh, I hope for it. I look forward to going to this race if I go, but I also look forward to just watching it or seeing footage from it because all the best in Europe are going. I know Ronald Fox is going, Baddy is going. I hope all the Europe top European guys go. All right, Max. So we did have a question that I wanted to bring up. It was in our news thing, but it's a great question because it's now March, nearly end of March. Uh, and as of now, we still don't know. Where next year's one eight scale world championships are going to be, we don't know if they're going to be in America, yeah. which by time line it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. You know, this is supposed to be the time when America was going to have the world championships, but be doing to be, it was supposed to be in Brazil in twenty twenty, but due to COVID, it didn't happen. But I think it's going back to Brazil. Yeah, that's what I heard as well. I I think it. Uh, at least some things I heard. I I, I believe it for, was from the EFRA AGM that mm-hmm. they were expecting it to be in Brazil now because it was just now in Europe. Um, I I have to say, uh, oh, well, there we go. I knew that was going to happen at some yeah. point. Yeah, I have to say, I don't know what the deal is but i think it's it's not the same facility as it was no. it was going to be the last so, so no no that's new... gone that's gone yeah so to look a lot of people are probably saying oh we got to go to brazil why didn't it come to america blah 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 so nick damon explained it because of how it went uh it it goes around it, it starts mm-hmm. somehow it starts over again where it would have been it goes to brazil this year next year then it's where apparently goes to europe the year after that again and then usa i don't know about that part so a lot of people might be saying, why Brazil? There's no market, blah, blah, blah. Well, look, man, I've been to Brazil recently. I enjoyed it. They race. Obviously, the market isn't as big as America or Europe. But right now, as you're probably listening to this podcast, they have the South American Championships going on in Argentina, right? Mm-hmm. They are a block of the Federation. Like They are a block of IFMAR. They have every right to have a world just as Europe does with Afro, um, America or North America has with Raw, and Asia and Australia have with Femca. There's only one been one or eight scale offered worlds that I believe uh, in Argentina. A lot of I know a lot of people didn't like it and all that type of stuff because they got you know with customs and all that stuff. But things have changed. Like things, you know, this was that was back in 2012. 
This is not. Yeah. It's not going to be 2024. Um, from what I, I think, my friends I in think, Brazil, real quick, sorry, yeah. uh, is that they're going to build a purpose, like a whole, just build a track just for this. That's what I think they're mm-hmm. going to do. Um, yeah. Also, Sao Paulo is a city of 22 million people. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can fly. I believe it's going to be close to Sao Paulo. You can fly into Sao Paulo, and we'll see if if it's going to be there. I mean, yes. Is it is it better? Is it more ideal? Is it more convenient to probably have it in America where it's easier for everybody to go and cheaper? Yes. But by the rules, these these countries they pay their dues. They should have a world. They have to have their chance to have a world too. I think. Yeah, I think I think the only the only concern I have is last time. So the venue chosen for 2020, uh, it was basically that you was gonna have to fly to Sao Paulo, then fly um, within Brazil to closer to the venue, and even then it was a few hours away from the airport. It was a difficult track. Brazil is a big yeah. country. Brazil is yeah. almost the size of America, by the way. Yeah, That's Brazil is huge. So that was the issue I had with the last time. Now I hope the venue they're going to have this time is within like an hour from uh, international airport. Because the thing is like the Vegas Worlds, that was perfect location. The Perth Worlds, not as good, I'd, I'd say. Um, same thing with the uh, Noxus where oh no, it, it wasn't Noxus, it was in um, Sicily, the mm-hmm. world's in 2000. Maybe it was Noxus called the place, but anyway, in Sicily, in it- Italy, that was an awful place from international standpoint. Redavan was actually okay, not great, but it was it was okay, and then uh, Bataya was pretty good. I think Charlotte was pretty good, but there has been a lot of world championships chosen, like just like, hey, there's a track in the middle of nowhere where you can't get in anywhere by international flight. So that, in my opinion, should be taken much better into account. Like, how do you can, how can you actually fly there? Mm-hmm. So if that is done well. I have no issue in it being in Brazil. And also, I think 2024 is a much better. I at least expect it would be a much better time to go to Brazil than during the. We're last, saying this. Last. We're saying this, and it could be. It could happen in America. I know yeah. a lot of the Amer- Like I know, first off, the nationals. Like I know that a lot of people are signed up because they probably think it's going to be in in America, and as a world mm-hmm. year. But it's it's still possible. But we haven't heard enough, and we probably should hear something soon. If Mar, if you're listening, uh, people probably want to. You probably want to let people know where that's going to be. They probably haven't have a decision. They probably haven't made a decision yet. Anyway, um, but we shall see. We shall see. So that leads me into my conclusion and something that I did on Facebook last week, which was I made some like questions uh, on Facebook, and it had. I just wanted to see where people's heads were because you know in this industry we celebrate things like entries instead of people, which is fine. I get it that you know entries are important for races and all that stuff. And then I always heard this thing. We got to build more. We need more tracks and we need this. And I'm not saying that we don't need more tracks. I'm sure there's areas that need tracks as well. But I think what we never say, what I never heard us say is we need more people. Like I, I never heard that. Like, so that, that made me think and focus on why we never heard that or why people are so important. Well, the bottom line is without people, you can't have entries and you can't have tracks. You can have too many tracks. You can have too many entries and not enough people. You can, I don't think you can ever. Okay, obviously, if you go to a race and it's a thousand people, that's probably too much. But I think we can never have enough people. And people will throw up these false flags. Oh, these big races, they're doing so good. They got all these people. Well, let's take a look at DNC. I know Rain had a big factor on this, but they had a hundred less people than last year. And I'm going to be honest with you, you can feel it. When you think about 100 people, right? So that's really 200 to 250 people because you got to add that 1.5 person. That 1.5 is their pit man, their, their, their significant other with their children. You know, people come, like bring whole families to this. So all of that was kind of missing. And I, w- I think I, I w- I've been trying to put together like why I felt like I felt like this, right? And I think my last really big, so I did do like Masters of Dirt, which was great, had a lot of people. 
and I did Florida Copper Championships with a lot of people as well. But what I think really got my mind was doing the worlds and going to my first worlds and experiencing that. And then I just remember seeing all the people that were out and about. And I was like, wow, this is the first time I've been to an RC event where it doesn't, where it feels more than an RC event. People are there, you know, people are socializing, people are drinking, having a fun, bleachers are full, watching racing, people from all over the Europe, people were flying in. I mean, like my buddy Axel flew in like from LA just to come watch the world. People flying all over to come watch this. And I was like, people, man, people is what we need. People is what makes RC awesome. I always say this. I'm not rich. I'm not even paying all the bills from this stuff, but I'm rich in relationships and all, everything that's good that's happened to me is be big because of people that I've known in RC, you know, even jobs that I've gotten. So I don't know. People are important. And I think as an industry, we need to all remember that. And we need to all put some focus on people, all of us, not just, and this isn't going out to any particular person. I know people try to twist my words around and all that stuff, but no, people are important. Without people, you can't have interests. And without people, you can't have tracks. So just remember that people are important. I know that's a bit sappy, but that's how I feel. Max, um, also, I forgot to mention going on this weekend. I did mention earlier the South American Championships. Good luck to all my friends that I met there. I know my friends from Peru. Sergio again there, Alex Lim from a good bit of my Aqua guys again. He's going from Paraguay. Sebastian's going from, he's not a my Aqua guy, but his guy I met in Colombia. It's good to see uh, South America getting back to racing. It's at Speed Paradise. I'm pretty sure that Nico Bragante or Augustino, Augustine Coutinho are going to win this. It's like Nico's home track. That guy, if, it, if I had to imagine somebody that can go out there and just get better, I watched that guy turn burn gallons of fuel to get faster. You <laughs> just go out there and burn gallons of fuel. So it's going to be interesting to see. I think they'll have coverage. I wish everybody good luck. Bueno suerte. And um, yeah, just like we said earlier, that South America deserves to have a world too. Yes, it might not be convenient for everybody, but if the world's in Brazil, that's where we're going to go. And we're going to have fun. Learn your Portuguese. Um, Max, I think that's it. We've been recording for quite some time. Um, you have a good weekend, Max. I wish you guys, everybody that's going to racing this weekend, have a safe weekend. Uh, if you're listening to this on your way to racing, please, uh, you know, hit that sub, that notification button, leave a comment, all that type of stuff. Like I said, if you're listening to this on the audio side, leave a comment, leave a review. Uh, thank you to all the NNRC squad around the world, wherever you're racing around in the world, have fun, be an RC ambassador. Nitro is the glory. E-buggy pays the bills. 10 scale builds the skills. Uh, thank you to all the patrons of the NNRC. Honestly, you guys helped me out so much. All the YouTube members, if you wish to help me out, it helps me. This RC stuff doesn't pay the bills. Chelly. But, uh, you know, we got to go forward. Uh, you get early release. You get early release of this podcast, patron only podcast. You can do that. The, the link is in the written description of this podcast. And um, thank you to these awesome companies. If you're a company, you want to come on board, you like what we're doing, hit me up. We got tears for everybody. If you guys see any of these, we have links, affiliate links, Coupon code where you can save some money for some of these. And just links that maybe don't have anything. But if you buy it, just let them know you got it from, you heard about an NNRC. They are invisiblespeed.net, high tech RC, Sun Pedal USA. Good luck to whoever wins that. Don't forget, we have a giveaway and you got to go listen in this podcast to find out. You got to win it. Sidewinder Fuel, welcome to Sidewinder Fuel. Glad to have them on board. Mayako, Beach RC, Techno RC, Clinic RC, Ignite Design RC, Racecraft USA, Call RC, WRCE. House of RC, RCDP, shout out to our drivers, David Ronafog, Jared Tebow, Robert Batty, and Alexander Hagberg. Max, Nitro's the glory. e buggy pays the bills. If you ain't grinding, you're sliding. Is it Lefty and Max? Are we out? Are we out, Max? We're out. Nothing to say? Thank you for your time, Max. And, Thanks um, for everyone who enjoy RC and make it more fun. Yeah, for thank you for all the support. We can't do this without you guys. And the professor, everything, or the arrogant one, he appreciates it too. Um, Max, I'll see you next week. We're going to geek out on PNB. You have a good one. I can't see you do a salute. So I'm imagining you're saluting right now. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye.